Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to The Take-Up. Today we have episode 56, Design Deconstruction 1, Simple to Complex. Hey, everybody, and welcome to The Take-Up. I am Eric Campbell, if you don't know, and we are here again on another awesome Friday to discuss machine embroidery, digitizing, and everything, decoration, and in the decoration business, decoration art, decoration business, embroidery, everything, every day. But here we are, Friday. Happy to have you guys in here. Uh, continuing on from last week, if you missed last week's show, episode 55, we really talked a lot about the sorts of things we do to represent art, to deal with art interpretation. And from there, we're going to get into design deconstruction stuff that we didn't get to before, which is talk directly about how we address designs and to answer some requests from you guys. I had some requests to go over some of my most popular designs, some things that I've shown quite a lot or that have become kind of show pieces for my career um, and pieces that are just showed up in my social media that people wanna hear more about. So we're going to be a little bit looser. We're going to talk about things in a different way because I'm going to be jumping onto software and just doing some slow replays of designs and showing you things, showing you the art discussing how I make decisions as far as digitizing and what I do to interpret things. But we do have some other content there and we will talk briefly about uh, how I approach designs in general. It's something that I've talked about quite a bit. So uh, hopefully you guys are in. We've been having some issues with StreamYard today and I can see that honestly, uh, <laughs> we've had some issues. You can tell I'm wearing my headsets right now. Audio has been acting up a little bit today and I've seen some issues with uh, uh, video playback, stuff like that. So if you're having issues, please go ahead and refresh. It should be all right. Um, but you will see certainly some things already uh, lined up for you as far as content's going. Uh, I have the links up. If you haven't seen yet, the links list is already up for today. We've got quite a few links there. Uh, some of them from yes, from last week's show and some are new talking about interpretation, stuff like that. And actually I'm gonna go through those really quickly for you guys, just to kind of give you an idea of what is in that list. Not everything is entirely germane to what we're doing today. Some of it is attached or close to or interesting to you otherwise. So I will go ahead and jump on real quick. I'm gonna add to the stream. You can see that I've already got up um, my other kind of images we're gonna work on, my designs are gonna work on. You know, one of the ones I promised to go over was this big, uh, article piece, the big cover piece. But if we go to the links list here, you'll see we have quite a few things that are there that might be interesting to you folks. Uh, number one, stitch types. It's a really basic piece that I did for uh, the only stitch. Well, I did as about the only stitch. I always tell you guys there is only really one stitch in machine embroidery. There's a line from point to point. And the way we stack those together is how we make stitch types. This is for Mr. X actually, MrXStitch.com. Uh, where I basically just went over some basic stitch types and how they were used in uh, embroidery digitizing. This next one, for some reason, the the, uh, the links list didn't render the title correctly, but this is digitizing details of designs. And this is me talking about the breakdown process I'm gonna to describe today as far as interpreting art and making digitizing happen. Uh, the other thing you'll see here, there's an earlier episode that I think is really actually um, probably a good foundation for anything we're going to talk about as far as interpreting art, which is stitch types and motifs and how to use them in machine embroidery. So that's episode 36. In that, I talk about what sorts of shapes get filled with what sorts of stitches. And that's certainly uh, incredibly germane to how we decide to execute something. Because a lot of people aren't talking necessarily in interpretation about other stuff. They're saying, okay, I just really don't know what sort of stitch types to put where. That's certainly a big part of it. Sequence is another big part of it. Layering is a big part of it. We'll talk about that later. However, that's a pretty important one that I think will be useful to you. So if you haven't seen that one, go back at some point where you have to, you know, zip through it, throw it on fast speed, though I know I'm a fast talker. <laughs> Hearing me in double time might not be the easiest thing to do. Um, next one also, another take up episode. Episode 22, Developing an Eye for Machine Embroidery. We are sincerely going to talk about this again. We are going to discuss how we break things down. But developing an eye for machine embroidery is really about getting yourself to this point where whenever you look at an image, you can very naturally break it down into the shapes that you need for embroidery and know what kind of stitches you would use to execute what sorts of objects, what sorts of textures. So I think that's interesting. Um, also, this is actually a prototype kind of article. This dimensional embroidery digitizing really informed a lot of my early classwork that I've done. So if you've been in my courses, you'll see some stuff that's interesting to you that you might recognize that was expanded on in my live courses. And this talks about how we use different stitch types, the way we break things up in order to create dimension. I think the best thing we can talk about with embroidery is dimension. And once again, uh, hopefully I can show you guys samples and stuff again. And I realize now that I didn't grab my, my sample kit like I thought I would have. <laughs> so I may have to grab some stuff later and grab it for you. Um, but dimension is all about 
what we can do with the sheen, the actual three-dimensional nature of embroidery. And if you saw last week's show where I showed you the samples, kind of held them up and flashed them around, um, that we do see a lot in stitch angle, in stitch type, in texture. And dimensional embroidery digitizing will help you out with that. Uh, a couple other things there are just tertiary where we'll talk about like uh, the DAX shows. At the end of this, I'll tell you that I'm doing some DAX uh, live stuff. It's more embroidery business, so it might not be up everybody's alley. And the last one is just related to fonts and some of the other stuff about one of the logos we're going to talk about. So go to the links list. It's already up in the comments. It's the first comment up there. Scroll back and grab that if you missed it. Uh, and you will be able to check out all of this additional material on your own time when you have a moment. Uh, but with that, let me go ahead and say hi to some of the people who are in here. I like to interact with you guys when I can. Uh, yes, is already in. Hi from Sweden. Happy to see you here. Jeff of the Embroidery Nerd. Uh, doing good stuff, Jeff. Happy to see you here as well. Uh, Lisa. Hi. <laughs> hi, y'all. Well, hi, Lisa. Happy to have you here as well. Uh, Ramona says, I'm running back and forth from here to the machines, but I have the volume up. Ramona, you know this stuff. You'll be good. Ramona's been in a lot of my DAX classes, my digitizing classes, so I'm sure that she is well and <laughs> in hand with a lot of what we're talking about here today. Well, there'll be some repeat, but you know, I think that being reminded of these techniques, thinking about these things is worthwhile, especially if we're in production. Sometimes it becomes easy just to try and fill stitches uh, into our designs quickly, get them on machines, and, and we don't think about that interpretation. No, Ramon is not one of these, but it is easy to lose yourself in the standardization of the thing, and it's good to think about how people are doing it, and honestly, to see how other people do it. Uh, Frank from the UK says, good evening, Eric. Good evening to Frank and everybody who's out that way. Good evening to you guys. Thank you for spending that time with me. Uh, Mike, reciprocator number one, Mike Muldowney. Hey, 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 happy to see you. Greg in from Boston, good afternoon. Justin Armenta, digitizer himself and also of M Nerd, embroidery nerd stuff going on. Hello, happy Friday. Regina is in, hi. And uh, Daniel says, I had an issue with Dallas traffic, but I'm here now. Now Daniel uh, actually won very recently uh, an impressions contest for digitizing and does incredible work, some stuff that I don't do, certainly. I know a lot of people say, when I, when I comment on their digitizing, they'll say, wow, it's great to have a digitizer like you uh, say something nice about my work. And what I'll say is, you guys all are great digitizers. There's tons of great digitizers out there like Daniel here who are doing stuff that isn't always in my wheelhouse either. And I would say this, there's there are lots of different people doing different things. I like to think I'm a pretty good talker and so I help people out, but there's people who are doing awesome digitizing and, and Daniel's work, he did some awesome nature work that was great and some shading stuff. There's this awesome skull stuff. Go look up the impressions awards from last year. I, I got to be a judge for this. It was it's hard not to be excited about seeing stuff that you know I got to judge, but as a judge, I got to talk about the stuff and he does some really great shading work and it's worth looking at. So look at other people's work. It's always good to see how people do things. Um, Brian says, got in from the school run, have Friday. Brian Bailey, creator of Embrilliance, who knows embroidery stitches on a level that many of us will never know. Because <laughs> when you have to program a computer to render them according to a, your own uh, methods and means, well, boy, that's something extra. That's a little bit more. So somebody who creates embroidery software may know more than I do about these things. Uh, Amy, hi, Eric. Hi, Amy. Happy to have you in. B Thrash in, T uh, TGIF in South Carolina. Nice to be here again. Nice to have you in. Marta, look forward to Friday. So do I. I look forward to these two, believe me. Uh, and Brian says, when he says it, does anyone else sometimes hear the lonely stitch? Yeah, no, surely. And, and that's the thing. Uh, sometimes when I look at it, I will say this. People, people <laughs> might be right in thinking, hey, weird, the only stitch. Man, you talk about all these stitch types and combinations. But if you look at machines that do generate other kinds of stitch types, sometimes you get jealous. I know I look at chenille machines and actual chain stitch machines and think, man, I got to emulate that stuff. You guys get that texture for free. <laughs> other kinds of machines and other kinds of techniques and other kinds of fiber art get to do things we don't do. The one thing I've always said, hand embroiderers, I'm jealous because you have ultimate control of every stitch and you can loop and tie and knot on the surface without doing anything underneath because you have three dimensional control. However, you have to make all those stitches by hand. And uh, if you've ever been a machine embroiderer long enough, I don't know how you go back. I can't stitch anything by hand. I've done some hand stitching in my life. I don't think I'd ever do it again. I, I prefer letting the machines do it. Thank you very much. Uh, Lori says, hello. And Ramona says, I always pick up something new from you. You know what? That just makes my day. I am happy to hear it. Uh, I'll say this, no matter when I have gone for education, um, number one, I value education in as much as if I pick up anything new. If I go to a session and one new thing comes up, one thing I haven't thought of, or if it reminds me of something that I wanted to do and didn't, if it sparks something in me, if I get an idea while I'm listening, even if it's not what the speaker said, I'm going to tell you the truth. I find that to be a, val a valid class and a valuable class. 
And uh, when I've done this, now I haven't done a lot of embroidery classes, funny enough. I've, I have not been in a lot of that. But when I go do other sorts of classes and webinars, I really do consider one thing. One thing is enough to make me happy. So if you guys pull one thing out of this today, consider yourselves uh, well paid back for your time. I think that's how it usually works. Also, what I'd say is you listen to things over and over and over again. It takes, we always say this in marketing, it takes seven to 10 touches, seven to 10 exposures to something for it to sink in or provoke action. Well, same thing here. It'll take you seven to 10 times hearing me say the very same words before it really sinks to a degree of being part of your uh, vocabulary, part of your way of thinking as far as embroidery is concerned. So stick with me for a few episodes. <laughs> I'll say stuff repeatedly, don't worry. In any case, let's do a couple more comments and then we will get on to the actual meat of the matter. Uh, number one, let's bring in Joe Rita, who I love to see your work, Joe Rita. does awesome stuff and picked up digitizing in a major way. Uh, ready to watch and learn, you know, ready to teach. Hopefully we will have something I can show you that is worthwhile. I think um, the cool thing about doing something free form like this, where I'm going to kind of jump in and just talk about, number one, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the steps of interpretation, but just looking at designs and saying what was going through my mind. And also I'll say this, I kind of intentionally didn't prepare a lot of the discussion in my mind. I wanted to look at the design again and say, these are the things that stand out to me about interpreting designs, about the designs that I'm looking at that will be interesting to you, hopefully, about what that mental process is as a digitizer looks at a piece. And because I have a range of pieces here, I have three pieces, I'm potentially gonna mess with a fourth piece that are going to show you a range of like very, very simple, the simplest kind of design that can be the baseline to something that's fairly detailed, maybe not the most detailed thing on earth, but something that is fairly detailed that is something that looks a little challenging that has some, you know, that has some difficulty to it. By looking at these different things, we'll see number one, that the process really doesn't change a whole lot. It's more about the complexity of the process, how long it takes and how much forethought you put in and how much testing actually goes into it. And that um, really anything you can do can be broken down atomically and can be addressed in kind of that staged fashion and that it's very natural to make choices, roll them back, experiment, work on things, especially when you're working in new territory, you don't know what you're doing or you don't know exactly how you wanna render something. The last thing that I think is important to make, make very clear about this is that we are doing something that is subjective. This is artistic that is subjective. What we can say objectively about embroidery is there are some qualities we want. When something is supposed to be covered, we want it to be fully covered with stitches. Uh, when two items are supposed to touch, we want them to be registered and touching. We don't want a border to be floating in space away from our filled area. These things are objective. Uh, we don't want a design to be so bulletproof that you can't stand to wear it because it feels like a big piece of cardboard or shield. These kinds of things are, uh, those are objective things. We want it to run so well that it doesn't break a bunch of stitches, that it doesn't uh, break needles, that it is fast on the machines and efficient. Those are, are, are very much uh, objective. We can judge those things directly. But the way in which we render things artistically, the way I make a wing may not be the way you make a wing. We're gonna talk about a wing shape today. The way that I decide to render a, a detailed background or something photographic may not be the way you decide to render it. And you may make completely different decisions based on some of the topics we'll talk about in far, as far as evaluating a design. Um, this is okay. Not only is this is okay, this is desirable. I will say this, when I look at other digitizers work who I know well, I can see their hand in it. Very much like looking at a painter's brush strokes and seeing their hand, you can see decisions that we make and it does lead into the character of what you do. And if what you do becomes valued among your peers or among your customers, um, then that's part of why they choose you. And there is some uniqueness to it. Uh, I tend to have a fairly, funny enough, as much as when I first started, everything was very regularized, flat, filled, unidirectional, not very textured. A lot of the corporate work was done that way. I think that my hand is actually a very old school technique. I look more like, let's say, um, old school lace work or something like that. I tend to use texture. I tend to use uh, different directions, breaking things up, lots of satin stitches. That's my hand. That's my imprint on my art. That is not what everybody's going to do. And honestly, it's not always the best decision. There's different reasons why you would come to it different, in different ways. And if you go back to some of those earlier videos, you'll definitely see where I talk about this. And um, for my part, most of my customers were very happy for me to break up silhouettes, flat areas of fill into multiple shapes so that I got some texture. People liked that. They tend to think of that as something interesting and novel. I did have a couple of customers who didn't like it and wanted the flat art back. 
these happen. These, these things happen. It's subjective. But let's go ahead and jump out. We have a couple more comments, and we'll jump into the meat of the matter here. Uh, number one, Mike Muldowney says, I hand-stitched a patch to some coveralls a while back. I did not take a picture of it. <laughs> You know, it is hard to go back. And I'll say this, I the hand stitching pieces I did were okay, but I'll admit it. I, I guess I must be lazy or I don't have the patience once I watched a machine do it at, I mean, even the older machines I ran at the lowest speed, you know, five to 800 stitches a minute gets real hard to watch it again. And now, as we know, if you've seen the stuff from ZSK coming out soon, they're talking about having a, you know, 2100, 2200 stitch per minute solid foundation in their machines. Those big commercial machines running at more than 2000 stitches a minute. Now, I have to see it to believe it because it is always the case that I find uh, slowing down a little bit will decrease some of my distortions and make things run a little bit better. Uh, I still have a tendency to not really want to run full bore at, you know, 11, 1200 on machines that are rated for it. But they're talking about running it 2,000 stitches per minute. If they can do it, uh, you can uh, not only um, without causing distortion, they can really change the economy of, of embroidery in that way. But hey, you know, I, I, hand stitching is just too slow for me. And by the way, hi, Jenny. Happy to have you in. So let's get into it, guys. First, I'm going to talk just a little bit about some of the things we have to do. And like I said, if I bring this back up, I'll bring in my screen for a second and say a lot of this is going to appear... Um, when we're discussing like this kind of breakdowns, you'll see this stuff in some of the different articles. Um, I've got this one that's on um, Images Magazine about how to digitize daunting designs. It is very similar, but I actually gave you guys um, the piece from, and we'll go ahead and grab that back up since I closed it. Uh, Ghost in the Embroidery Machine actually is maybe a little more palatable as a way to get the same information. It was made to be an online blog post in the first place, not kind of a reconstituted article from print. So sometimes these are a little easier to read. But this is the same kind of stuff we're talking about now. And so I thought I'd bring this up just to show you a little bit about what we're discussing here. When I break down an embroidery design, what are those kind of steps that I go into when I'm looking at a design? What do I do to figure out what I need to do, what I want to create out of something? And the first thing is always analysis, right? And yes, we sound super technical. I'm gonna I'm going to address this quickly because the truth of the matter is, last week I, I definitely heard heard some folks. I'm like, yeah, you know, what? it sounded pretty complicated. I went into the weeds a little bit, and I said, here's what it is. I'm tend to be a pretty cerebral guy. I will go into the weeds, go technical uh, at the drop of a hat. The thing is, I use technical words for something that's really not that technical a concept. When I'm talking about analysis, it's about looking at a design and saying, you know, we want to imagine the end product. And if we're trying to imagine the end product, we're trying to imagine what it is, we're trying to break down that design and say, what is it going to look like, right? And we're also trying to figure out, hey, what's important in this design? We're talking, if we have a customer, then we're dealing with stuff like customer expectation. We're like, all right, we have this piece, and this is a piece that I've, I've done, and I, I don't believe I can blow this up any larger, but I will bring the screen up for you for a second. I believe that's all I can do on this particular one since I got in the article. Okay, good. This one actually has the blown up piece. We've got this design. It was a papal banner for uh, Pope John Paul. I did a bunch of these for a guy who these are reproductions from pieces that were hanging in the Vatican um, and this pretty big piece, right? Well, I have to talk to the customer about what's important. The original piece was brought to me as a photograph taken down from a balcony. And I wish I had that picture ahead of me here. If you look up uh, the papal banners that I've done, you probably will see the picture of that thing hanging off a balcony. And I had to redraw this all in vector, which is why you're seeing a bunch of this stuff here. I actually redrew the piece fully in vector before I did it. Super expensive piece. The guy paid, um, I think about $600 for the entirety of the things that we did for him. Uh, and so expensive piece, custom piece. I did all the artwork for him as well because I needed to kind of analyze it and the art was really poor. The thing is I had to talk to him about his expectations, what he was looking for in the end. And I also kind of had to understand what license I had to make changes. So part of the analysis is that, of course, it's just customer expectation. And this is really coming down to, the, to uh, what's important. Because a lot of the time when we're looking, especially at daunting designs, detailed designs, the first thing we're looking at is like, man, this thing is photographic. It's got a lot of gradients. It has a lot of shading. Uh, this thing has really tiny text on it. This thing has really tiny details on it. And some of these things aren't physically going to work in thread or aren't going to work in the space that we have available. We're dealing with hats or left chest designs, very similar stuff. Or even in a home situation where we're dealing with an art piece, but it's a four by four hoop that we're stuck in or five by seven, and we don't have a ton of room to work with. Well, then we're not going to be able to make every little detail show up. Now, this one actually 
not necessarily super finely detailed, but it did have some things that I had to talk about with our with my customer. And I had to look at this and say, what are the things that are important to this design? And also, you know, how can I make it interesting? What's important here? And to me, I'm looking at the decoration saying, if I render this all flat, let's say that um, you know, we've got these little florets, we have this kind of acanthus or or foliage work that's around the border. This stuff could be really boring if I just render this as flat stitches. You know, it's not going to look all that great if I just go for it as is. So what am I what am I going to see is important? Well, I'm going to look in here and say, all right, these areas, I want that to be pretty detailed. I want to see some detail in there. So what am I going to do? I'm going to break this up into some satin stitches because we know I get shine and shadow. I get a little bit of uh, visual interest there and I can make it interesting. I'm going to analyze the piece and say, all right. Also, I'm going to look for what I call obstacles and opportunities. In any design, I'm going to look at, at it and say, what are the things that are going to cause me problems? Uh, where are there places where I could save myself trouble? And in this particular piece, we had a pretty easy one. I have this nice big field of blue in the center, which I think that the this looks a little more wrinkly than it actually turned out. It was on some very light satiny fabric. So um, before it was fully finished and steamed out, it looked a little rough coming out of the hoop. But I will say that uh, looking at this piece, I'm like, you know, this really would do well as applique. This central piece, all these other little pieces, could some of these be applique? Sure, they could be applique, but it doesn't make as much sense to me to make these applique. So I'm like, all right, what are my obstacles and opportunities? Obstacles on this piece, it's huge. I'm running it on some fairly thin material. I'm gonna want to lighten that up. I don't really want to see you know this much heavy fill on everything. So I've got to find a way to break up some of this stuff. I will also some of the obstacles on this. I think it's gonna look pretty flat, as I said before. If I don't do some rendering where I work on these individual elements as pieces, it'll look boring if I don't vary the stitch angle some if I don't have some details to bring it up. Uh, also, I didn't like the idea of this being a big flat fill just without any detail on it. So I wanted to put this, as you see, this satin border on it to give it a nice clean edge and a little bit of texture to go with everything else. So obstacles and opportunities, I'm looking at those obstacles and I'm saying, what can I do to fix those? And where do I have opportunities to save myself time, save myself effort, and to make this piece look better? This particular piece, I'm saying, all right, I've got applique. I've got something I can work on there. So I think that's that's interesting in and of itself. Um, but that's, that's part of the analysis. It's part of what we're doing. We're going to stop and say, all right, obstacles and opportunities. Where do I have obstacles? Where do I have opportunities? Piece like this too. And you, I, I've talked about this piece before with you guys um, where... I have to get visual interest out of a piece and I don't have a lot of time. My obstacle in this case is my time. I don't have time to render all of the texture that was actually in this piece. It had a lot of shading in the lizard. The shading was actually gradient shading, was not you know textured like this. My opportunity is I'm gonna do this as a jacket back. And once again, this just happens to be, these are large pieces. Uh, I can use applique for that. And I have this that I can grab on hand. I've got applique I can use for this banner behind it. Between the two, I can actually use applique to get a lot of coverage and I get a lot of what I would call free visual interest from the te texture that's in this applique piece. So these are obstacles and opportunities. I'm looking at that. Now, certainly if we're talking about a design that has a bunch of tiny textures in it, that has a bunch of detail in it, I'm gonna say, hey, my obstacle will be, how am I going to render this tiny detail? If it's a gradient, how am I going to render this gradient? How much time do I want to spend on manually rendering this gradient and making it work? Um, but then my opportunities would be things like, all right, I can open this thing up. Maybe I can use my existing piece and make it a little larger. Text, if it's not something that's important to the customer, I can work on that detail. I can isolate a certain portion of uh, the piece and make that the most important piece for people. So these are these are interesting things we can do. Um, the next kind of steps we're going to work at, we're going to stack up solutions. We're going to build this store of solutions. This is thinking ahead about what we're going to have. So we're stacking up solutions. This means we're going to look at the piece and say, all right, what kind of solutions do we have? What things can we do to address these things? Like I said, the obstacles and opportunities, that opportunity to use uh, applicant, absolutely. The solutions, I'm going to talk with the customer about what's important in the text, talk about them what's important in detail and say, here's the things that we need to render differently. Maybe like I've shown you guys before, you're doing a full body character. Maybe you can render a bust or a face because that's the actual important thing be going on a small area. Uh, these things are the way we do it. We go through our problems, all of our obstacles and say, all right, I'm gonna stack up all my solutions before I get started and say, these are the things I can do and see what's available and also what's acceptable to a customer if that's who we're dealing with. Um, after that, we're going to parse the design. And parsing the design is just what it sounds like. You're you're taking it apart. You're taking a design apart and saying, what are the elements in the design? Where are the backgrounds? What are the elements in the piece itself? It, 
and honestly, uh, with animals, it can be the bodies, the legs, the head, the mane, the tail, the wings, the feathers. We think about those parts. Uh, if we're thinking about something geometric, we can say, here's the logo, here's the logo type, the text, here's the back layer, the front layer, the shading, the base color, the borders. And we think about these pieces and we say, all right, I've got all of these pieces that I need to render. I'm going to go through this piece and say, what's going to make sense for dimension? We often work from the back to the front because obviously if something, this hand is in front of this hand, now I know that this hand is closer to me than this one. That's the natural rendering of distance. That's the natural rendering of dimension. And we can do the same thing in our embroidery. What is on top is closer to us. And also if we have something that's, that is maybe abstract, like a Celtic knotwork, we might wanna say, all right, Celtic or Viking knotwork, something like that. We want have a certain over under pattern we wanna plan on. Well, we need to think about which elements stitch first or where we can mock or fake the fact that something goes under something else by the way we arrange our stitches or maybe by the way we do certain under stitching or we do certain supportive stitching or break up elements to make them look like they go over and under where they belong. So when we're talking about parsing, we're going to be thinking about layers. We're going to be thinking about what should be in front, what should be in back. We're going to think about how we're going to render color. Where are the big areas that we're going to fill in? What will we shade lightly on top of those areas? How will we layer these things together? Um, what goes first? What goes second? How do borders interact with fills? If there's something filled that has a border on it, how do elements need to meet or match? Because we know if something is going to meet exactly in the art for, for most things, we're going to have to make sure they overlap so that pull compensation, push compensation doesn't cause issues. Uh, we might have to leave gaps with, between borders and things that we're going to push into where the borders are, especially with straight stitch borders that don't cover anything. And we may have to think about sequence as far as execution. If we have a really large piece, we may have to execute one area with the kind of registration elements where we have filled areas and borders and little details drawn in one area before we move to another one. Because as we move around in a large hoop, we may find that our registration gets looser as we move around uh, going color to color. We might have to change our color sequence, stuff like that. So parsing it first, it's just about breaking things up into the elements we think we're gonna draw. And really part of that is thinking about, hey, how will we draw these elements? If something's under something else, we know we may have to drag an edge under a border to make sure that we have our pull compensation handled. Uh, so we're going to think about how we break up into shapes. And all of this so far, we haven't touched our digitizing yet. This is us debating how we're gonna do this. This is us thinking about the sequence. We're going to look at it, parse it, and see what those shapes are that we're looking at. And we're going to look at things like, like I've shown you guys before, if I look at a silhouette of a person, I might decide, hey, I'm gonna separate the arm from the shirt, from the legs, from the head, even if it's a one flat color, if I want to carve those in different stitch types, stitch angles, so that I get some dimension and make it look almost like a, a sculpture painted one color. If I'm going to do that kind of sculpture work, defined work, parsing means I'm going to think about those shapes. And then once again, think about which is first, which is second, which is closest to me, which is further away. And that's how we're gonna handle some of that. And, and in that, we're gonna visualize our sequence. And you know, in visualizing the sequence and in parsing, uh, we do end up with an idea of, like I said, that layering. And not only that, this is also obstacles and opportunities time. If we think about this piece of this design here, this is from a big motorcycle patch. And I'll go ahead and blow this up. And you guys have probably seen this piece before. A lot of these pieces that I show you, it's because I have really great samples of them. Um, now that I have access again to a larger machine, I'll probably be running some of my other samples that you don't see very often. And I have some new pieces I'd like to do to show you guys. But this piece from a big motorcycle patch, if I look at the obstacles and opportunities in this one, and if I look at parsing on this one, the other thing I have is I can see that I've got this wolf head that's in front, right? This is in front of this cluster of wolves. It's also in front of the motorcycle rider. And I can say, all right, well, I know that I'm going to obscure these areas. I'm going to do this last, which also means if I want to keep all these blue colors together, I'm probably going to do this entire cluster of wolves last because it's on top of all the other elements that are in the design. And as we get all the way up to the front, you can see that I have places to hide travel right? I have places to to hide travels. Um, when I'm working in this sequence, I'm going to say, how am I going to get from one element to the other? And because these are individual fills, as you can see, we have different curves in the fill here than here. We have uh, carved lips and noses and ears that have satin stitches involved. I've broken the head away from the ear up here. And I can actually zoom in tight on this stuff. You can get, get a better look at it. You can see that these are broken up elements. And if I've got all of this, you know that I can 
travel from piece to piece. And in the in the essence of trying to make this both more efficient for a machine, we know that we lose the most time in trimming and traveling. I'm going to be able to run running stitches underneath other elements as I travel. I'm going to think about the sequence and Here's our obstacles and opportunities, right? Yes, an obstacle is I've got a bunch of this detailed work I need to get done. You can call that an obstacle. Uh, I need to get these these kind of gradations in through. It looks like I've got four colors of blue here, but what I actually, or three colors of blue, what I actually have, as you can see up close, is I have two colors of blue and I have different densities on top of each other in order to render a, uh, and, and it looks maybe like four colors because I also have some really light shading here. In order to render those colors, I'm actually just interleaving these two colors of blue. The, so we have those obstacles. The opportunity is I'm only going to use two colors on my machine. Another opportunity is this blue highlight is going to be taken from these blues that are in here, the blue highlight on the handlebars. The other opportunity is a big one. This wolf right here is identical to this wolf right here, though I'm going to have to chop up the sequencing and make it make sense for the design. And I'm going to have to be careful in grabbing these pieces and moving them around. I'm going to digitize the entirety of left wolf over here, and I'm going to copy and paste it over here to right wolf, and then I'm going to remove all of the objects so that the color sequencing makes sense so that we run all of one blue before the next blue. So this is another one of those obstacles and opportunities. I'm gonna say, what's gonna save me time and effort? Well, if these two are identical, I'm not going to draw it twice. I'm going to do one wolf and then the other one, and I'm gonna look at places I can copy and paste and potentially do some other editing on the run to say, yes, I can make some changes here. This wolf is asymmetrical in the center and there is only one of them. I'm gonna to have to digitize it all. These two are symmetrical and fairly well identical. I'm gonna be able to copy and paste that. And that's part of my, that is part of obstacles and opportunities It's part of my analysis and part of visualizing the sequence. So when I look at this original art, I'm going to notice that and call it out, right? I'm gonna look at my color sequence. I'm gonna look at what goes on top and I'm going to finish with this wolf. And you'll see, of course, I'm gonna go in order with colors. The base color on this trio of wolves is that blue, the medium blue. You're going to notice that certainly that that's going to run first. The second piece of it's going to be the, the lighter blue. And as you can see, I'm going to run a half density fill. As you can see here, half, I believe it's about half density, maybe a little bit less. Uh, in this area here, I didn't get this one out for analysis. It's just because it's in the article and I talk about it. Like I said, wanted to go loose. I think going loose here means I can just talk about what comes up and give you some ideas. But about a half density fill that's in all of the lightest areas. Some of these aren't filled. These were lines here were drawn manually at the spacing. They are as far apart as this fill is but they're drawn in little curves. You could have done in other tools, but I drew them manually so that I get some roughness. There's a little bit of manual stuff here and around the eyes as well. It's not done with fills. It's done by just drawing with little running stitches and uh, lining them up very much in the way a fill would where they line up on the fill below them so that we get that shading. If, As you know, if two elements of a uh, lighter density are on top of each other, or even if you run, you have a fill underneath and then you have a lighter density thing on top, running the same angle means that they'll fall in a little bit together and blend. It's not always what you want. On things that you want to stand up, you don't want that. You want under layers, something to separate them so it stands up. But when you're trying to shade, often it is the right call to let them blend a little bit. And then of course, I'm going to run another round of the brighter fill, the more complete fill on top of that lighter fill so I can get the highlights in the blue. Then I'm going to run the white because the white here is part of these highlights. We see the eyes, everything else. I wanna run the outline last so that I can run it right on the edges and get this nice clean look around those edges. All of the dark outline runs. And then last, last but not least, I'm gonna run this detail work in, in each side. Then we have these satin stitches. It's multiple elements, but you can still see that in general, these satin stitches are now going to end under here. They end under here and they are under here on this side because once these are both run, then the final outline is going to be unbroken, is going to be the front wolf. The only thing that you can see is is broken, if you want to call it that, are these mitered corners and some detail that I added in here. However, this piece is done. You can see, yes, mitered, but these are definitely one big piece. There's one unbroken kind of border on top of everything else. So this is what we're doing. We're visualizing our sequence both artistically and on the machine. The other thing I'm going to be thinking of is if I'm running this detail work here, how do I get out of this detail work into my border? How do I travel and then get the border put together so that I'm now in a place where I can go for the next piece? And I actually, without looking at it, I can tell you immediately, I started here for this outline, came back to that spot, 
and then I ran up here, ran it, and I ended here because I'm sure that I came in here where I'm closest to the next thing I'm going to run as far as the details. And certainly there's a trim. There's actually a trim here in this piece because this little bit of outlining here um, had to have been done either last or there was a trim involved because there was no good place to connect it without being super visible in that dark blue. But that's what I'm talking about. Um, we're visualizing the sequence. We're going to say what's behind, what's in front, and then we're going to make decisions about it. And also this is telling us about how we're going to draw. I know that when I'm drawing this blue shape, I need this blue shape to extend under this border. I get to hide a lot of sins, if you want to call it that. I can hide all my travel stitches under a satin stitch border. Whenever I see something has nice, big, fat satin stitches like that, for me, that is the travel run highway. I am going to run all my traveling stitches under there, and I'm going to manually plot that. I'm not going to jump. I'm not going to trim. Uh, like I said, going from one color to the next, there is probably, I, I would say without any doubt, actually, looking at it here, in this light blue, that's one big piece of thread that connects to the next and never breaks because I'm going to stop filling everything on this side and then I'm going to jump over here, run here, and I think you can even see it. I jumped in over here to start the next piece. You can see that I have run where I had to. Now, certainly, I will say that there's some texture in here from having to run down this side. It was unavoidable to travel, but there's some of that stuff that's going to happen as you travel. And I mean, that's the thing. You hide travels you do your best to run them underneath other things and you layer in a way that prevents or that provides dimension uh, where you occlude things, you block things that are further in the back. So uh, I'll go ahead and grab a couple comments here just to say, you know, just to kind of bring them in here um, before we get going. Like I said, we are going to talk about the designs and we're, we are actually going to analyze a little bit of the designs we have here and, and talk about this. But I'll, I'll, a couple comments here that I think would be interesting. Uh, number one, Joe Rita talking er about earlier um, this piece where I have these leaves up here, I believe. Uh, on the satin leaves, do I use short stitching? Um, I believe if, if it's a really tight thing, I would use short stitching. I would not use short stitching or broken stitching on most of these. Uh, on, a, on a piece like this, on the machine that I had, I would probably not use um, what I would call a length limit stitch or an auto split satin, whichever software you're using. For us, Stitch Artists is a length limit stitch with an edge pad. Um, you will see that there is a length limited stitch here. These were too wide and I wanted to render them in a big satin-like element. So there are some uh, length limits in here. So those are rendered that way. You will see in this piece, this is also a length limit with an edge pad here. Um, instead of using a fill stitch, I wanted a nice shiny. And as you can see it, look at that shine on the edge of that um, edge padded border on that piece. This is what I want. I want it to look a lot like a satin stitch. However, it's not really a satin stitch. Uh, it is broken, as you can see, by the kind of dent that is running up the middle of it. And it's also not hugely wide. This is probably about 15 millimeters or more wide. It's rather large, you know, more than half an inch. So uh, this, is, this is a piece the size of a flag. The piece that you're looking here was on a banner. We're talking about an, a piece that is really very large. We're talking about like you know 15 inches or something in height. So we're we're not we're not looking at small details here. So you're not going to see a lot of short stitching. What you but if that if you meant short stitching on the inside of corners, then yes. If you're talking about breaking things up, um, I will just say as looking at this piece, and I'll, I'll tell you this. This is how I analyze it. I'm going to say, all right, big flat area. The background behind this is going to be a fill. The inside of this key is going to be a fill. Why? It's a big flat area and I want it to be flat. I want it to recede. I don't want it to be up front. I don't want it to be shiny or have a shadow on it. Inside of this key is a fill. Inside of this cross shape is a fill. Back here is a fill. The uh, elements of this crown, this miter is a fill, but they are a curved fill that follows the curve of the actual object in the world. If this was a real papal miter, it would have a curve to it. I'm going to use a curved fill to render some of that and get a little bit of the shadow and the shine. Um, if I look at the edge of this key, that is a nice column. It is pretty small. It's pretty thin. I'm going to use a satin stitch. I'm going to use a satin stitch of a different direction for the other edge of the key. Now I have a shadow and I have a shine and the light will be different on both of them as they turn in space. Same thing here. These are columnar. This, this tassel is made up of individual narrow columns. When the art came in, of course, when I looked at it, it was just a big picture of a banner from far away. If you look at the vector art, you could render that flat and just draw on all of these lines. If you wanted to, I'll go ahead and make this larger one more time. Um, if you wanted to, you could go ahead and take this piece here and you could render that as a big flat fill all the way up to the rope border and you could make it flat and you could draw all these lines in with a darker color. And, you know, Bob's your uncle, you would have a tassel. It wouldn't be necessarily bad. But in the light of this piece that's ornate, that looks like it's uh, architectural, sculptural, it very much looks like some sort of escutcheon on a wall that's made of plaster. It has that kind of look to it or metalwork. 
I thought the tassels should have dimension. So these are all rendered in a single color. This is one color of light old gold. I believe it's rayon thread. It could be polyester, but I believe this one's rayon. A lot of home decor stuff I would do in rayon. Uh, and this piece is rendered in overlapped satin stitches. That's all these are. There's a satin here, satin here, satin here, and then back to the center. And the satin in the very center is on the top. Why? Because a tassel, if you think about that tassel in space, the tassel is round and the front of this rounded object is closest to us. And it makes it look a little nicer and a little more prominent if it's the very top stack, top of the stack as we overlap. That's thinking in sequence. That's thinking about dimension. That's thinking about uh, how we do things from the back to the front. Uh, last couple of comments here. We'll go ahead and bring those in and, and then finish out kind of this discussion of the analysis process and, and you know, just the discussion of what I do to do a design before we can get into it. Um, last couple of things. We have uh, Mike saying, I can't stop looking at that blue gradient on the wolves. Love that so much. And what I'm going to say is it's very simple. You go look at like Daniel, who came in in the comments earlier. Daniel's work is more complicated than this. Uh, he does a lot of stuff with like uh, fish and outdoor stuff, and it's got more gradient work, more shading, more silk shading than this does. This really is three fills, kind of artistically managed so that we end up with the most density where the lightest blue areas are. Just layers. I mean, we're, certainly we're seeing I've got a little manual shading around the tongue here so that I get an edge and I get a dark spot in the middle. We are seeing that I've done some manual shading around the eyes here, in the cheek here, along the edge of the ear, just a little zigzag. But the truth of the matter is, once I have done some work to say how open should the density be to make something look a certain way, that's most of the work. Otherwise, this right here is one block of curved fill. There's another block of curved fill, both of these in a really light density that follow the same curve that I used on the underlying um, blue fill. That's all it is. And then up on top of this where it is where it is full density, we've got another half density fill that I uh, offset. Like let's say we've got these two and they're sitting on top of each other. Well, I offset them so that they're much closer to full density. And I'll actually say I probably should have cut a little more density out of the lower blue on this. I did cut some away, didn't cut all of it away also. Like I said, uh, though I can say objectively, I like light densities on pieces. Certainly I want light densities. Um, though I objectively want that, the truth of the matter is on a big back patch on polyester twill, hard as nails for a biker going on leather, I worry less about the density than the look. Because the customer wants a stiff patch going on a leather jacket or a denim jacket. And the ideal for them is a bulletproof, big, thick patch with full coverage that has a lot of detail in it. That's what they're looking for. That's what I'm going to give them. And I'm going to worry a little bit less about how loose this is. This was going on a garment that was loose. It's going on a denim shirt. If it's going on some a sports shirt, it's chambray, it's something like that. I'm going to worry more about the density that's in here. Big polyester back patch on a jacket that's hard as nails. I'm going to let there be a little more fill here, and I'm not going to worry too much about it. But hey, that's the thing. It's it's situational and it is subjective to a degree. But we'll go ahead and let's go through the last few little steps here. I'm not going to go crazy, but we're going to talk about this. Once again, um, if we look at things like this, uh, we can talk about our sequence. This particular piece, the reason it's interesting is just that um, in these little yucca flowers, and I'm showing you some real tight pictures. They look pretty good, right? I can see some, maybe there's some registration that's not perfect. But in these little tiny yucca flowers, this area, um, I actually rendered the outline right after these flowers and I did these all together. I had them on their own color changes because this piece really did not want to stay stable. This is from a giant jacket back I did for um, Burlington Northern Santa Fe, the rail yard folks. And I did this kind of uh, very simple roadrunner design. You can see that we do have some interesting stuff. These are carved satin stitches. I wanted each of these little uh, feathers in the, the wings edge to show up. The rest of this is a fill. I didn't carve every single feather. And that's, you can say that. I didn't carve every single feather. Um, areas that are interesting. The tail is something that is very iconic on a Roadrunner. They have this long tail that's stiff as a board and they kind of flap as they walk around. Um, the tail on the Roadrunner is super iconic. I want to put a lot of detail in it. I used uh, nice big satin stitches on this and a pretty heavy kind of bean stitch outline on it. And it's, like I said, this is a graphical piece. This was not a photographic piece when I got it. It was super vectory, big flat colors when I got it. So it's not like I'm, I'm doing it a disservice, I don't think. However, I did elect not to render any of this stuff in any carving. This is just a big curved fill. What is interesting is that I do have a nice subtle curve here and a curve that follows the shape of the wing and goes up into the neck. But this area, that's a big fill. 
big fill stitch with some uh, stitching on top of it to denote some feathers. Even though I tell you to carve stuff, I don't carve everything. But what you, what you will see is the legs, satin stitch, and I have cut out of this body and I follow the anatomy of the bird to say, this is where the leg comes into the body. We can kind of see that we have a different texture here. And I went ahead and cut that out and I started the leg first and did the fill on top so that it works. So you showcase the detail that's important and you think about the technical. This did not want to stay registered. The little yucca flowers did not want to stay registered. So I, I ran them right before the outline and ran the outline right on top of them right thereafter because the rest of this was staying pretty okay in register. Uh, the yucca flowers did not want to because they were too complicated. They had a little yellow piece, they had little white pieces. They had all these different little elements all in satin stitches, which looks all nice and shiny and great, but um, it didn't want to stay in register. I'm pretty happy with how all the registration turned out on these. Uh, you don't see any poking out stitches at these ends, which is something you would expect to see from satin stitches like this. I had to pull short so that those satin stitches as they push out didn't pop out of those outlines, but it did make sense, right? And you can see that I'm using direction to make some sense of it. Same thing here, um, the yucca leaves are all individual satin stitches instead of a big fill so that we get some shine on them. And as you can see, that's one color of green. And even just looking at this kind of curved as a sample, you're getting a different shine on each of those leaves. Uh, so same kind of thing there. You're thinking about these elements, you're putting them together, but you're also thinking about technically what has to happen. Um, if I ran the outline on these yuccas way after I did some other work elsewhere in the design, let me tell you, the yucca flowers won't stay in registration. So I had to stop and outline these separately. It meant it was less efficient. It meant I had an extra color change, but you have to make it work. And that's the thing. You, you, you still have to make it work. It's still technically a thing. Artistic stuff is great. Love it. Want to render things artistically. I also understand a lot of us are in business. Uh, filling here makes more sense. Big fills in the background makes more sense. Um, but I had to do this outline, even though it wasn't as technically um, <laughs> proficient right next to it. It wasn't as efficient because I have to make sure it's running correctly. Let's pop out of that for a second. So execution is the next thing. When we're looking at our piece, we're going to execute, we're going to work on it. But the thing we have to remember is that we can iterate while we're working. If you have something you're not sure of, um, try it out, test and iterate, make a piece, do this. Sew out just a piece or an element of something, see how it runs, how it looks. You know, you're looking at that shading. Great ideas to make a little curved block of fill. Uh, make another fill on top of it in a couple different densities and see how much do I need of that lighter blue together to make the effect that I'm working on. Test and iterate. It's not something you can do for every piece, but when you are in downtime, when you're working on something difficult that you haven't worked on before, testing, looking at it, iterating is fine. Also, there is nothing as just go ahead and drawing it in your software, taking a look at it. And with the idea of, of embroidery that you have developed, the eye for embroidery developed by watching embroidery run and measuring your own pieces, you'll figure out what you can do, what you can't do. So test and iterate. Next thing is to uh, replay and revise. Uh, as you get into stuff, you want to do replay and revision to see what things do, how they work, and to say, all right, I can run it at a speed that's faster than I could in a normal replay of any other kind, and I can look at what's going to happen. So look at your piece. If you're not sure where you're going, if your sequence looks a little funky, go ahead and hit that ribbon, draw a ribbon, do the, the replay, um, watch it, do kind of like the pre-flight check, but you can do it halfway through when you're running on. I mean, I'll go ahead and play this one while we're working. This is one of my very old pieces. So it's an old video, but this is showing you how I broke up this piece. This is the Sundari Imports piece where you see this woman here. And she's got, once again, we look at our sequence. In the back is the bolster pillow. It's behind the woman we're rendering. But the thing is, I'm not doing everything in the back because honestly, some of the layers don't really occlude each other a show, but here's her shirt. The shawl she's wearing on her head is on top of that. So I did it on top. Also it allowed me to do the, uh, to sequence the shading on top. So I've got that darker pink on top I can use for shading on her pink uh, shirt. You can see that I built the layers of her shawl out of satin stitches so that I get those natural ripples. Looks just like a, a gathered garment. Uh, the fingers are on, all done separately. There's a curved fill for her stomach there. Now that should be further back in the sequence, but I decided to do it this way because of the way everything came together. And because I wanted the face and the neck to actually come up forward away from the shawl. So I'm trying to both uh, have the number of color changes reduced and keep the uh, detail where I want it and the sequence where I want it. Same thing here. You'll see that I have three different fills on both sides so that the legs that are cross-legged come forward on the dress and that the legs uh, in the different angles will have a little bit of a different shine. And once we get on top of that, we have the border that's on the edge that finishes out kind of the frill at the bottom of the dress. And it allows me to do the gold kind of brocade tassel element that's in the front of the dress. So I'm thinking in layers, I'm building it up in layers and you can see how it's being put together. The belt gets done, the borders get done, the details get done because I wanna keep all the gold together because I want it to be one color change. Also her bangles are all in one place, her necklaces, 
uh, borders on the shirt, which also hides the gap, it hides the overlap between the shirt and the body. And then at the last, I'm doing detail. And frequently, the, my detail runs like this. The shading runs will be last. Um, pretty commonly, you'll see that. Boy, I didn't know that YouTube was going to throw those ads in the back of that. <laughs> However, you can still see uh, that the detail work goes last. Um, this is what we're talking about. So in in, sim in a simple way, that's what we're talking about. Um, so we're going to then, after we're done with doing that, we're looking at our sequence. We're pretty happy what we get. We're going to stitch and evaluate, and we're going to do it again. So stitching and evaluating it, really, we're going to stitch it. We're going to look at what happens. We can't really see what happens until the thread is down. We know that as embroiderers and as digitizers, the file is not our produce. The embroidery is our produce, so we have to stitch. We're going to evaluate what we have, and we're going to revisit anything we don't like. So with that, let's jump into the software. Let's get into it. Let's actually start looking at um, the designs themselves. So we're going to pop into our designs, and we're going to talk about them. Um, everybody wants to see this one, I know. But I think, yes, I've talked about this one a few times. I think maybe we'll talk a little bit more about this one, this uh, flying monkey patch. We are going to talk more about the uh, cover as well. I'm going to hang out for bonus time. We are, we're are we not even at the hour yet. You know, guys know you probably got another half hour with me right now. But I think we'll we'll start maybe here after and maybe do a little bit of work, like I said, on a simpler piece. One of my simplest pieces, we'll talk about that too. So these are the kind of the pieces we wanna look at. I may, I'm gonna probably, I may work into this one a little bit. It's another one I wanna talk about, but this is the simplest piece. I'll probably spend less time over here because I think this is a little less like what you would do, but I will, I will discuss it a little bit. It, it is very much like what we've already discussed up to this point with the pieces I've shown you, but let's start with the simplest piece ever. For me, this piece, the TLC piece is absolutely what I consider the baseline to the point where my wife knows this piece. And the joke is the TLC plumbing logo is like, okay, I'm trying to teach anybody anything. I'm like, well, it's not the TLC, you know, it's the TLC plumbing logo. It's nothing. It's not that hard to do. This is what I often like to call coloring book artwork. Why do I call it coloring book artwork? Um, it has nice big filled areas and these filled areas are bordered with a satin stitch. They they hide, like I said, hiding all sins. I know it's a joke and I know uh, Justin thought this was funny. Uh, you can hide all of your travel stitches underneath them. You can put nice big overlaps on them as long as you don't go crazy. That means everything will register nicely. Uh, it means that the sequence doesn't have to be maintained. Yes, this blue bar is in the front of this stack. The thing is, because we have the outlines here, I can use the outlines to tell you what's in front and what's in the back. And I don't have to worry about those colors being in that order because I'm going to hide the overlaps under the outlines. The outlines are gonna show the overlap. So a piece like this is super simple, but there are certain things I do and I think about when I'm looking at it. Number one, I'm gonna say, all right, where are my colors all at? Uh, I'm gonna look at this piece and say, I wanna run this bottom piece first because I'm often going to be running on things where it's gonna be a little more stable that way. I wanna run from the bottom to the top on this particular piece. So I'm gonna end with the red because the red's gonna be all this stuff. Plus I'm not trying to spend any extra color changes. As you can see, this is something I'm going to run thousands of. Trust me, I'm gonna show you a little bit about it, but you see these people all over my town, the TLC plumbing people, they're still using my logo to this day, even though it's been years since I've been digitizing for them. Um, and this is a very simple piece, right? Very simple piece. Um, overall size here, it's uh, 88 mils wide. So, you know, three and a half inches, something like that in that range. This is going to run thousands and thousands of times. I want it to be pretty efficient. There are gonna be some trims that are unavoidable, but I don't wanna add another color change to this thing if I don't have to. So as you can see, one, two, three, four color changes for four colors, no, nothing more than that. Yes, we've got some trims, couldn't help it because these things are floating free. Um, but when we look at this, there are some things I'm gonna analyze. I'm still gonna look at what's in front once and back, but like I said, I've got coloring book artwork here. I don't really have to worry so much about what's in front, what's in back, because I'm going to hide that all with my borders. So let's go ahead and scrub through this thing manually and say, all right, what did I decide to do first? Well, the blue bar. The blue is on its own. It doesn't have a second element. And I want to go kind of bottom to top because of stability uh, and because I'm going to outline the letters first because I have more concern about the letters outlines hitting just right than I do about the bars. The bars are going to hit pretty easily and I'm going to be overlapping a lot. So the first thing I do, I'm going to run a little bit of underlay and I've got a nice... Uh, a nice piece here, nice piece of fill. But we are gonna look at this fill and say, what are the things that are interesting about this fill? Well, yes, I've got a fill, but we have that angle on it. 
Got a very slight angle so that the border, when it finally does run, doesn't tear it apart. Because I've got horizontal borders on the bottom of this thing, uh, horizontal and uh, on the top and bottom, I'm going to have to make sure that my fill stitches or my satin stitches don't pull apart the lines of the fill. If we have a complete 90 degree intersection like this, it's going to all those edges of this fill or the satin stitches are going to grab that edge and then pull down and make a big gap. I don't want that, so I'm going to set this thing with an angle. You can see that I've got perpendicular uh, tatami style or fill style underlay on this piece because it's going to go on a ton of colors. It's going to go on every range of colors, every range of uh, contrast levels between the thread and the eventual piece from black to white and multiple things in between. Even though that's not the classic thing it's going to do, it will be used that way. So for me, I don't want to re repurpose this thing over and over and have multiple versions necessarily. I'm going to use some decent underlay under it. And as you can see, this is what I've done. Perpendicular underlay so that every stitch just about rides on two rails of underlay. Um, without looking at individual stitches, trust me, it does. Next thing I'm going to do, or actually, before I get there, there is one other thing I'm going to show you. You guys have seen me talk about shape distortion, right? You see me talk about shape distortion if you've been with me for a while. If you haven't been with me for a while, I'll talk about it now. If you try and make a square, right? I'm making a square shape here. And if I have a 45 degree angle fill, that's the angle of my fill on that 45 degrees. Um, what you're going to see is what? You're going to see uh, in the angle of the fill, it's going to get shorter. So it's going to pull in the angle opposite of the fill angle, it's going to push out. So what we're going to see is that corners tend to go up and down. They tend to go in the angle perpendicular to the fill angle, right? So let's say that the fill angle is here. Then we're, the fill angle is this angle here. Then we're going to see it pop up here and pop down here. Uh, and that's something I can show you a diagram of. I didn't pull, pull it up today, but I don't think we really need to say that. Just that, let's say we had a 45 degree angle here. This is the angle of all the stitching. Then we would see it pushing out this direction, pushing up this direction. And we would see it pulling in this direction and pulling in this direction. Along the angle of the fill, it's going to pull in a little bit. Uh, it's going to push out contrary, you know, perpendicular to the angle of the fill. If we're on something, let's say an even woven material that is weak on the 45 degree angles, it's going to do it a lot. And you might even see on a bordered piece like this, let's say we did it at 45 degrees especially, on a bordered piece, you might even see that those two points at the corners, especially the 45 degree, might wanna go north and south and get outside of the border. It'll look like you have a piece of underlay or something sticking out. What you actually have is your square has become a rhombus, a diamond, and the two points of that diamond are actually escaping. They're going too far up and too far down, escaping the border. If that's happening, or if you're working on really stretchy materials, you may actually crop those corners and I've also used a lighter angle. I've used a less steep angle to make it work, but you also might crop those corners. And you're actually going to see that I have a tendency when I'm drawing my shape, when I'm drawing my shape, not something that's done uh, programmatically, that I'm actually cropping those corners. You see down here, you can see it in the underlay because the underlay is set for a, a, you know, a, a line just inside the shape. I'm going to go ahead and crop those corners just a little bit. So it's it's pushing in that direction, right? It's pushing the direction of the travel, and I crop that just a little bit. Also, um, it does mean that I don't make a bunch of little short stitches because if I get down into this por portion that's below the angle, because we have this corner that's not going to be following the angle of the stitches, we end up doing a lot of little short stitches in here that really don't show. They aren't going to be there. The border would obscure them once the border runs. Later on, once we see it, the border is over top of that entire area. And if we push right up to the edge of this border, and I'm going to zoom right in on this piece for you to show you, um, you're not going to see those stitches. Those stitches will not do anything for you. So you might as well draw that shape and kind of crop that corner. Is this a little fiddly? Is this more work than you necessarily need to do? Maybe, but you're running thousands and thousands of them. I'm going to avoid pushing out in this direction. And I'm going to not make all these little, little short stitches and travel back and forth when I go through this piece. So as you can see, when it's being drawn, when I'm drawing the original shape, of the fill, I'm going to crop that corner just a little bit so that the fill stitch angle, we start the fill here and we fill up without making a bunch of little short stitches that have to fill this corner that are useless. So that is something I do. And so even on a simple design, you are thinking about things like um, push and pull and the direction of travel and things like that. These are all part of what we're discussing when we're thinking about that stuff. So I, I will bring a couple comments real quickly. Um, Lisa, talking about the uh, the Roadrunner says, love how you choose the details need to be showcased. Beautiful as always. Thank you. I will say this. That's about that's the whole thing about the analysis and deciding what's important about the design is choosing which details are the most important and also talk to the customer what they think is most important about their art. 
Uh, Lisa also, mini test sounds so to find what works is a great idea. I know people don't like to waste materials. What I'm gonna say is once you get a feeling for things, you don't have to do nearly as many mini test sews and uh, doing them when you need them, when you need to figure something out is incredibly useful and saves time overall. And I'll say this too, uh, Mike says, if you're starting that rectangle in one corner going to the other, is it really pushing back toward the corner you're starting from? Um, I find that yes, a little bit. Plus I have a tendency to just crop them both because truthfully, we're still gonna make those little short useless stitches. The little short useless stitches in the corner, they do nothing but add more needle penetrations, more time, and uh, often kind of more confusion to the uh, processor, the stitch processor, as it tries to find a way to travel through everything. Um, it has to go back down into this corner that really makes no sense at all, mo makes no difference to the finished look of the art. And so I just cropped that really quick. The thing is, this doesn't take a lot of thought later on down the line. When you're starting to draw, you'll just get to this point and say, okay, stitch angle is here. I'm drawing this line here. I'm gonna drop a point here and I'm gonna drop a point here and just cut this little corner off. It takes no time and it becomes a habit later. And what it does do is stop you getting buildup in the corners. You're already getting kind of buildup. And I'll say here, I could probably have worked on this uh, underlay. I used an automatic underlay here that I didn't really care too much that it wasn't perfect um, because I didn't want a really short stitch in the corner. But you are usually building up a lot of density in these covered corners anyway. Why not hack some of that out? You know, why not not drop another 10 stitches in here that don't need to be here because we're going to have to try and fill that little corner. So yeah, it doesn't push as much in that direction. We get, I think you do get kind of more push in the direction of the travel, but yeah, as it stacks up, yeah, it, it pushes a little bit in both directions. Um, more, if I'm heading up, which I am in this case, I'm heading up and to the right, which actually is backward for you guys, for me to you guys because of the camera being reversed. If I'm heading this direction as the screen shows, then yeah, I'm going to see more of it at the top. But um, I think this is useful to do just because we cut, we have all these little teeny tiny stitches in there that are kind of not not smart for the processor. It takes more time to run back there and fill them, and they just add extra density. And as we guys we talk about a lot, the three dimensional density here, guys. Um, a lot of our density isn't about what's stacking together on top. It's about all these little stitch penetrations, and we're going to drive a lot of little stitch penetrations through here if we don't cut that off. Um, so even when I'm doing a simple design, yes, I'm thinking about that kind of stuff, um, but I'm not stressing about it. If you didn't do this and you filled it, would the design come out okay? Yeah, for sure. For sure. You're not going to have a real big problem with it. Uh, what I'd say is if I was doing this for efficiency's sake, I'm definitely going to crop those. And you can see on the other corners, uh, same kind of thing here. Um, and I should just use my zoom tool for this. Um, but here, and actually I'll say, this is a, a this is a piece uh, that's quite old. And I'll say, I don't think I have the final production run on there because I see a jump in there that wasn't in the actual production run. But you'll see that I, I'm kind of cropping to that level as well. This one, I could even crop it a little tighter, but that I, I, at the angle of the stitch, I'm cropping that corner a little bit, even though I'm getting further into it here. And also in this piece, because I've got the two fills here, I, I'm not worrying too much about um, this pull, there's not enough pull to cause it to come apart in this area. And I'll say from the actual runs, there's not enough pull. I, on something super stretchy, I probably overlap these a little bit more. Uh, but you will see that I cropped it to that very shallow angle. And uh, glad to see this DJ who teaches digitizing himself uh, in a detailed way. Uh, glad you talked about this is often ignored. Yeah, all the little tiny stitches in the corner are, are something that you have trouble with. Plus, if they get smaller, maybe you reduce the size of it. You don't have your stitch processing just right. Uh, we all know small stitches are where we have problems, lumps, thread breaks, stuff like that. So why why drive a bunch of little small stitches in the corner? I just like to be as efficient as I can be. But let's go ahead and look at this entire design one more time. We're going to run through this pretty quickly now. Um, so here's the fill, bottom to the top. That's all we're going to do. Like I said, I can see that there's some sequencing issues. This is probably not the production file now that I look at it. Um, but this then once again, we're going to go ahead and run the white run that out and you can see cropped corners again. You see that angle, it's at the bottom, the left-hand side of that white bar, cropped corner. It's just to keep off those extra little stitches you would generate. You don't need to generate this. Uh, same thing in the red, but you can see I went ahead because I don't want to waste a stitch, uh, 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 not a stitch. I don't want to waste a color change in this case or a color stop. I'm up into the T and we're maintaining the same angle so that, because we just want a uniform look. There is no real dimension in this piece aside from the border. Uh, this is one uniform angle. Why? Because this is just a simple piece of lettering. We're not trying to do anything crazy with it. This is a com comic book coloring book pieces. Also, could you do this with automatic digitizing? If one would ever work, it'd be something like this. At the same time, you wouldn't get the efficiency, you wouldn't get the crops, and you probably wouldn't have it uh, think about things like uh, your penetration points, how dense things are, stitch breaks and efficiency. Is this the best design on earth? Absolutely not. <laughs> this is an early design for me, but hey, you know, they're pretty good. What I will say is interesting about layering in this particular piece. Um, 
if you look at it, the outlines are layered. I start at the top and go back down. Why? Because this blue bar is supposed to be the closest to you. It is on top, as you can see, because it's obscuring the other two colors. It looks like a stack of three similar size bars. Well, the border is layered that way because then I do have the border running the same way and having it occluded, covered by the next border in the sequence. So border on top, second border in, top border on top. Why? Because at these junctures here, in these corners, we actually do get this concept. We get this idea of one being in front of the other of layering. And we do have that in here, as you can see, if I zoom on into it. Um, yes, there's some other stuff going on here, but you'll see that it does very much look like this is a solid bar object on top of this, on top of this, because the borders all layer on top of each other. And like I said, is this my crowning achievement? No, this is not a really great design or a fantastic design, but it was still something that became iconic. And I think it, it's just fun. I'm gonna show you something really briefly before we get into the next more fun designs. Uh, and this is that these pe people, um, this shirt became iconic for them to the point that they ran a bunch of uh, ads. And if you guys wanna see this ad, I can always show you more of it. But all of the ads and all of the people from TLC, their uniform shirt, became the look, became the brand of the company to the point where when you're looking at any of their advertisements, and these used to play in the theater, which I used to love that, going to, going to the movies, uh, my wife got real tired of seeing uh, my logo on everything and going, oh yeah, there's TLC logo again, because their logo and the text drops that were on these, the names became iconic to their company and became part of their branding. So as you can see, these guys are all, you know, plumbers sitting at the movies. But as they're walking through, the shirt became part of their iconic branding. So even a simple design, even the one that I use as my example for, you know, what's not important, what's not that easy, what's what's simple to work on, what's, you know, what doesn't require all that thought, uh, can be important to somebody and can be quite critical. And that's also why I put this in the list as well. When I talk about having a custom font make a big difference to your client, this custom font here, which is a Euro style oblique, digitizing this font so that I could type in their names became one of the reasons why I kept their business and they had a tremendous amount of business. So this is one of those things that I think is interesting, but suffice it to say, even when you're working on simple designs, you're thinking about layering, you're thinking about stuff like that. Next, I'm gonna go into the next more complex design. We'll talk about that and get into something a little more meaty, but I thought it was worthwhile saying, okay, yes, these are the kind of designs that you know you think these are pretty easy. They do still take some thought and, but it also tells you these, these concepts, are awesome technically. They work on the simplest design. We're gonna break down a more complicated design in the same fashion. They carry through. If you learn these things atomically, essentially, it will show you that base level and from that base level, you build everything else up. If you learn TLC, you will do the winged bunky patch just fine if you know what you're doing. If you learn that, you will do the big giant cover piece I'm gonna show you just fine because it's actually the same concepts applied over and over, applied at individual pieces of the larger whole of a more complicated design. Layering is the same, sequencing is the same, pull and push compensation is the same in the TLC design as it is in the carousel design here. This design, if you learn how to do it correctly, informs this design. <laughs> so yes, I know, seems a little nuts. That design gives you all the skills you need for the, for you know this design to happen. We only get to this if we know how to do the other one. <laughs> so like I said, it's elemental. It gives us what we need to know. And I've got a couple more comments I want to bring in before we get on there. Uh, Daniel says, on the old Digitrack, if you don't know what Digitrack is, uh, when we used to digitize manually on a big uh, magnetic board on the wall, six to one ratios, uh, on the old Digitrack, the first line of stitching determined the stitch direction of the whole fill. So I have always cut these corners just out of habit. That's awesome, something I actually didn't know. So th when they were drawing these on the big drafting boards and it was something they had to generate after you drew this, um, the first line of stitching was gonna determine the fill. So that those corners were always gonna be cut like that because that's that first line of stitching. That's awesome to know. And once again, probably why old school kind of uh, sometimes can help you out. And I'll say, I think a lot of the things I learned on the next generation up, I was not just young enough that even though I worked on very old equipment for my age, I'm just young enough in the industry that the equipment I came into was all on screen and was done with a mouse, even though it was DOS based, 16 colors, couldn't draw a curve by itself. 
all of that. I didn't work on the big uh, digitracks. I didn't work on the on the plotting systems. But I will say the things I learned in coping with all that manual work uh, let me more efficiently use the automatic tools we have today in things like Stitch Artist. Um, and I, I do love this. I still see stuff all the time. Daniel says, I had Milestone Electric here in Dallas. I see it everywhere and it's still a thrill. Yeah, I this far out of being a commercial digitizer in this town, a few years out from having been doing all the digitizing for everything for one of the largest companies here, I still see my, my work with great regularity. Um, it, one of the cool things about being a digitizer is your work lives on for quite a long time, as long as they haven't changed the logo. It's really cool. So that's one of those things. And by the way, uh, DJ says, yes, so true about this stuff. And uh, I wish I could see more cartooning. You guys don't know cartooning is really awesome. I will try and show you this. Maybe we'll do a history of digitizing history of embroidery segment at some point where I'll show you the big six to one drawings. They were called cartoons. Big six to one drawings of embroidery. I know I have one where uh, I've got a movie that they showed. I think it was uh, pieces for the like the U.S. Um, it's like for the U.S. Forest Service or something being done in uh, you know, previous to what we would consider current digitizing. It's not digitizing; it's punching. It was, and they were doing just that. They were drawing these big drafted. It looked like architects. They were drawing a patch out at a six to one ratio. So your little bitty patch is some huge thing. Uh, that's going to be going on the wall for drawing. And they were marking out with a Swiss wheel, all the measurements of density, things like that. When people did that, we had a lot more control of what we were doing, but it was a lot slower. So, okay, let's go from that. I know we had some stuff I promised I would look at for sure. And also, by the way, I'm going to say, uh, yeah, you learn so much from cartooning if you're starting out. Absolutely. Looking at that cartooning is awesome. And I'll say this too. If you look at people doing really crazy off the wall stuff now, there's a guy called Joseph DeJoris, who's, I believe, I can't remember where he's out of. I won't say because I don't know for sure. Um, he is out of, he's not in the US though. Um, Joseph does this crazy multi-level foam, like four different layers of foam. And though it's not being used as a drafting point, he sketches layers and sketches his drawn objects, the objects he's going to fill out first on paper and lays out stitch angles and lays out layers and draws them. And the cartooning looks very similar to old school punching. It looks very similar to old school cartooning because this hasn't changed. Pre-visualizing, and by the way, if, if it helps you, if you're the kind of person who's a hands-on person, draw out your designs first draw out your designs first on paper. That's totally fine. Draw out elements. I tell people, especially when they're breaking up fonts and stuff, draw out your letter and break it all up into the strokes and note all of your stitch angles first if you want to. If it, Some people really do learn. And if you guys go back to the episode where I talk about learning styles, kinesthetic learning where you learn by working with your hands is completely valid. So if, it's, if that's for you, draw. For, draw for sure. Uh, and Daniel says, that's a lot of work you put into that one. The background behind the horse, fantastic. And I'm going to say the funny thing about this piece. Yeah, I, there's a lot of work in it. There's a lot of work in it. And what I'll do first, I'm going to go ahead and, and blank the design out so you don't see that. Uh, let me grab this design and hide it. So this is the actual stitching that's there. It is complicated and yet it is simpler than you think it is. If we look at what eventually looks like a horse in this window, Oh, and uh, this, the horse in this window, the elements that are there, that shading, a couple pieces of fill, some manual shading, some overlapped fill, a couple curved fills. The elements themselves are not incredibly difficult. The pieces on the top of, uh, of this, you know, railing up here, these masks and faces, they're satin stitches that are carved. The thought behind it, the testing behind it is worse by far, or at least if you want to say worse, is more time consuming by far, uh, more difficult by far than the actual work itself. This was done on a black piece and most of this is actually the black showing through. It's just fabric. And the shading in the background is actually much simplified. I isolated the pieces that are important. And we're gonna talk about analysis because I promised I would go over that flying monkey patch. I think I will do this last and it may not all get done today. But what I will say is this, very much like a real photograph, things that are farther from you and are less important can have less detail in them and still render pretty well, right? You guys saw the actual piece. You know, I'll go ahead and talk about this because I think it, it, it makes sense right now. We're talking about it right now. I'm gonna talk about this. Uh, if we look at the art versus the final piece, I'm gonna throw this up on top of the entire screen. If we look at the actual photograph on the left, yes, it, number one, it was all in color. And I discussed with uh, the people who I was doing this for, it was Stitches Magazine back in the day. Um, I said, all right, it's all in color, but I really feel like it is cacophonous. It is loud. It doesn't really have a lot of definition to it. 
And because of that, it it really is losing something. I'm not getting a focal point for this piece. When I go to digitize this thing, everything is equally kind of important because of all the color. So the very first thing I did is actually alter the art. I asked them, could I render the background in black and white? Number one, because by the way, I was working on a nine needle, quite old machine. Uh, an old commercial brother machine that was not holding up very well is what stitched the piece on the right. So this is not about having the best machine. Um, it's not necessarily about having the best software. I had good software. I could do this in the, in any software. I could do this in, in Stitch Artist today too. None of these stitches are crazy. I'm not using anything specialty as far as uh, what you wouldn't see in, in most softwares. Um, so really what's happening here is um, the forethought, discussion with the person who I'm doing it for, and then some work on dimensions, some work on layering. I will say this was difficult. It did get me out of my space because you guys know I'm a commercial digitizer. I was really a logo guy. I am a logo guy. I am a jacket bag, left chest, hat, front guy. I am not um, necessarily someone who does this kind of uh, photographic work all the time, or at least I wasn't at that time. I did more of it later, but not, not a ton. And when I did, I usually rendered it in a simpler fashion because I was doing it for machines. I, I started out on six needle machines and then went to nine needles. So I was, and we're not rethreading in the middle of this thing. This is something we have to run in as, as you know, a commercial piece. And I thought of this as a commercial piece, despite the fact that it was a one-off. So the first thing I did was say, all right, what's important? What needs to show? And to me, I'm like that, that the first horse that's closest to us should be important. It should show, it should have detail. It should be where we put our focus. Let's go ahead and use color to separate these two things. Render the background in black and white uh, in grayscale, if you want to go there rather. And then we're going to render the front in color. We're going to render the one item in color so that it comes to the forefront. Also, that means that I'm only using, you know, like a couple colors of gray back there. I've got a, I've got a charcoal, I believe. I've got a medium gray. I've got a light gray and I've got the white from the horse. That's all I've got. And the front horse that you're seeing, it does have a light gray in there. It does have the outlining. But mostly it's white and most of the dimension, I'll say this is actually a flash photograph that they took for the piece and the flash washes it out. It looks better in person than this by far. It looks more lively in person by far uh, because of all the stitch angles you can see. But I started by rendering out that background. And as you can see in the photo on the left, in the background, things in the background are fuzzy. They're literally fuzzy. There's not a lot of detail there. You can't really see a ton. And though there is more contrast in the photograph on the left than there is in the piece on the right, I elected to keep the color gamut low. I've only got a few, few shades of gray in there. And as you can see, look at this horse that's over on the far right. And on the far right of the image, I didn't render the darkest outlines. I didn't try and outline everything cleanly. I let it be fuzzy. I let it be low fidelity. And if you actually look at it closely, there's not a lot going on. I didn't render a bunch of the detail. The horse that is second closest to us has detail, has outlines, has those things notated. Why? Because it is close enough to us that it's more in focus, but it's still in the grayscale. I can't make things really, really fuzzy and have them turn out the way I would like to look. They're just going to look like bad embroidery. So I did do the outline. I did make it pretty pretty detailed. I didn't want it to be fuzzy on the edges or ragged because the raggedness there would just look like poor stitching. It wouldn't look the way I wanted it to look. But I didn't render extra shading in here. I left it pretty flat because I didn't want to make it the most important thing. I rendered less of the detail and none of the color. By the time we get the closest to us, I'm rendering as much detail as I can. I'm rendering as much color as I can. I will tell you though, it looks like we have multiple greens in that saddle. We do not. We have three. There are three greens in the saddle that are making up for the multiple ranges of green and gold that are there. We have kind of a goldy greenish color, a gold color in the top. We've got a dark green there. We've got a medium green in the middle. And in between the stripes are rendered in different colors by interleaving the stitches. It's just low density. Um, and these in this case are, are turning fills run together. But you will see things like each of the little scales in, in this uh, in the background or in the saddle pad are rendered individually. The rope style twisted uh, central pole that's rendered in elements of satin stitch. All of them are so that we actually get the shine on top of the satin and the shadow at the bottom edge. These things are all rendered individually as we go down. You can see though, I left elements out. If you look behind the uh, carousel horse next to its pole, the pole from the horse behind it is not rendered. That brass pole is gone. Why? Because it was going to obscure too much stuff and it looked weird. It looked weird. It needed to get out of the way. I didn't render it. 
But what you can see is I used literally just really light fills in the background to hint at things that are there without being explicit because I didn't want to add extra detail. Bottom right hand corner there, you can see that there's some kind of structure down there, but it's not important to the main uh, thrust of this image. It just needs to have something there. You can see that there's a bar there holding something up. There's a plate down there. There's something that is the background. So we have shaded something, but it's not. I'm not going to try and show you every bolt. Whereas if you do look at the bottom of the horse in the front, the bolts are there. The bolt holes are there. These things are notated. They are shown because they're important to the eventual piece. So it really, it's about what is important to the piece, what makes sense to the piece. And because we're talking about this piece, I will go ahead and I'll zoom out to the entire thing. You're not going to see a ton of it. I'll go ahead and put it uh, entirely on screen in front of me here. And I'll just scroll through it so you can see what's going on. And the way I thought about this piece was I'm, tr I'm building back to front, like I said. I'm often building darkest to lightest. So you're seeing my darkest shading and then the lighter shading on top of that. Then we're building these solid pieces in that kind of lightest gray. We've got some detail pieces, but you'll see that I revisit things. I couldn't do it all in one piece because we're doing a really large piece. So I'm gonna track that back and then go back to it. We'll see that I'm building up the second horse in the sequence. I did allow for there to be extra color changes so that I could keep the registration where I needed to be because it's quite a large piece. Once again, this is a large back, a jacket back size piece and running, let me tell you, on a machine that was not real stable. But then you can see how I'm breaking up the horse's anatomy, right? If you look at the horse, even though this is a fake horse, we look at it, we've got the, the legs in the back. These are from a previous horse. They're behind that horse. Those two little legs at the bottom, previous horse, that's the back horse. That's the second one in the, in the sequence. Those are going to run first behind everything. I couldn't cheat them with the outline the way I wanted to, and I wanted them to really look like they were back there, so I did it. Then we see that this horse is back. We see the stuff on the bottom and the belly, and they're rendered in separate pieces, and you can see that the tabs are rendered before this satin that is kind of the, the anchor point on the bottom of the horse. Then we have the leg, and you'll see that that curve matches the leg and the haunch because it's on top of the previous leg. See how that previous leg is underneath it, that little back area there? Then we run the front leg. It's in front of it. It's closer to us. Then I decided to run the cheek of the horse, yeah, or kind of the cheek and the jaws. The teeth are separate from the nose. We have kind of that the area in front of the eye, and then we have the upper kind of cheek. And then you'll see that I'm building up these planes that are in the face of the horse. So I'm following the anatomy of the horse. Could I have made this entire horse one big slab of white? You absolutely could. It would be pretty boring. You can put a curve on it and maybe look okay, but doing this in facets makes it so much more interesting. And you can see I'm actually leaving space later because I'm going to be putting in the mane in overlapped satin and uh, length limit stitches. This curve, once again, matches the curvature of the neck. We're dealing with an actual curved thing in space that is kind of tubular. So we have a nice curved fill here. And then I've left room to put the mane on top. And I did leave room because it's too much density to layer all these satin stitches on top without doing that. And you can see, even in the way it's rendering, you can see how we're going to get detailing. We're going to get some shine and shimmer. We're going to get some shadow. Then I've done this shading here. So there's that dark shading. And now I'm going to start rendering the gear. We're going to start rendering all of the colors in the saddle, that sort of elements as well, up on top of it. Why is it on top? Because it's on top of the body of the horse. We are going to do some outlining, but it's going to be straight stitch outlining. It's not going to hide a lot. You will see, however, see how there's that shading, look in the place where kind of the bridle and the bit and stuff are. You'll, you'll see that little, the travel stitching here. That travel stitching is hiding under a later satin stitch. So remember me hiding all my sins. Watch as these areas that I travel through, um, these angles of the top stitching don't match the angle of the travel so that they don't show through by accident. So you'll see that all the little travels go underneath stuff. So here's, there's the blue stripes. We start building up the green. As you see, the, the dark green goes first. Then we build up that medium on top of it. And then we're building up the light green and the gold will come on top of that as well. You'll see that each one of the little gold scales is actually a curved fill of its own. And they are layered on top of each other. So we have real layering from the back to the front. It runs from the bottom to the top. Then you're going to see how that rope structure is created from individual satin stitch pieces. That is not a rope routine. That is individual satin stitch elements that were drawn one at a time. And then same thing with this fringe, a little overlap satins to the fringe all the way up the back. Then we start doing the strap and it has a border on it, very custom, very common stuff. We have all these little red outlines that are just satin stitches and they're gonna jump in on top of everything else. Then all of these elements that are here, the lip of the horse, the saddle, which has a nice curved fill to it with an underlay. 
and then we start doing black. Now we're detailing everything. It does actually have the painted black lines. I would say that if I did this again, I might actually choose a color that wasn't quite that stark, but you know, it looked all right. So I'm doing all the detailing work. It's just running a uh, doubled straight stitch on top of itself. No run is more than two, twice over. You'll see that like there's little bolt holes are actually done with tiny little stars I can move in and show you. And all this stuff is just outlined as we go. We have a nice thick satin to make some detail here. And we're just running all the details on top. And that's it, man. The only thing you get that's different is we do have a little fill here of color. There's a gem and then the cheek. I actually see a trim that's in this that wasn't in the last piece. So once again, I must have grabbed my non-production piece, uh, which is fine. Hey, guys, you're going to find that. You're going to accidentally put a trim somewhere it doesn't belong. Um, and also, this is a, a output film, a piece. It might be that that doesn't actually stitch. Sometimes they don't render perfectly. But then you'll see that the final border is everything. And you'll see I have traveled all around that border. You'll see all these little travel stitches that are hiding around this border. Because I knew this was a bordered square piece that was meant to have a border on it, uh, my final piece uh, could be on top of that. And I traveled all around without trimming. So what's funny about this piece is I did this one off for a magazine cover. And you would imagine that I wouldn't treat it like production. But because I am who I am and I do what I do, I was thinking about efficiency. I was thinking about traveling. I was thinking about production the whole time. So I'm traveling between elements with straight stitches, uh, short straight stitches underneath the satins. I'm not picking up that needle if I don't have to. I'm traveling under the outer border wherever I can to make sure that I'm not jumping and trimming all the time. Uh, these are the same things that you would do in any design that's, that's less detailed. Um, because I, I promised I would do it. Let me jump, jump to the monkey patch for a second too. We can do that and then we'll finish off on that stuff. So that, and by the way, yeah, true. DJ says travel stitches are also shorter stitches to drive into the fabric. Absolutely. Longer stitches are going to be larger, loftier. They stick up, they ride higher. They come forward to the front. Uh, shorter stitches have a lot of tension on them. They're going to sink in. So the travel stitches are shorter and they, they end up shorter underneath stuff. Also, if you're running though underneath something, they won't want to pop up and be proud and end up like inside of a fill or whatever else. Also, like I said, if, if my fill angle is like this, my travel underneath it is going to be running at an angle that's different than the fill on top so that we cover them instead of accidentally having them come through, especially if they were longer, they'd want to come through. And I know I talk with my hands a lot, but it is an easy way to, to notate that stuff. It's a lot easier than bringing up uh, a whiteboard and trying to show you guys. But yeah, travel stitches are shorter stitches to drive them in. And when I'm underneath another element, I'm not matching the stitch angle because I don't want those sh to show through. So if you're worried about that, that you're going to run on top of it and show through, um, watch that angle, make sure your travel stitches are at a different angle than the top stitching and make the travel stitches underneath short. I will admit sometimes with a super high contrast or if the top uh, fill isn't really dense, you may still see them and you might decide you can't travel underneath something totally fine. When you have full density satin stitches you're traveling under or fill stitches, chances are you won't see it and that's fine. And you can travel underneath it all the time. Um, so, and by, by the way, patches are great for this. Borders on patches, the borders on that TLC to design. Anytime you have a nice big satin border, like I said, that is my highway. I'm going to run all my travel through that. And I'm going to hide all my little sins in the corners, believe me. Uh, and Lisa, it's great when efficiency becomes routine. Yeah, I mean, I would say sometimes I learn from people who are doing artistic things that aren't efficient and have to check myself and say, I've worked too hard to make something efficient that didn't need to be. But I will say that uh, for my money, I have less frustration with my designs than other people's because they don't pull out as much. I don't jump and trim as much. And if I do run on a home or hobbyist single needle machine, chances are I've reduced my color changes because I'm used to the old uh, <laughs> low color, color choice machines and I tend to not want to jump. And that means I tend to not have to rethread a whole lot. Um, but that also means my art might not have the color depth of somebody who's willing to change 23 spools in and out. I never was um, to the point where when I have modern machines, as we do in the shop right now, we have a lovely ZSK machine with 18 needles on it. The chances of me using all 18 for anything are incredibly low. You'll use me using, see me using nine colors, sometimes 12 to 15 when I'm feeling real froggy <laughs> and I absolutely want to add some more color to something. But if I'm making my own art, I probably will accidentally be nine to my nine to 12 colors most times and no more uh, because of that, <laughs> that efficiency that became routine. But let's go ahead and look at this design. Like I said, I promise I'd go over this and I want to go over this because a lot of people uh, ask me repeatedly about wings and wings. I, I love carved wings. If there's one thing that looks great in carved satin stitches, it is wings. And this little winged monkey design, when it came to me, I'll be honest with you. Uh, the first thing I saw was very, very boring, incredibly boring. 
and it's not that the design's boring. This thing has all kinds of good stuff going for it, right? If we look at this design, all kinds of great stuff going for it. Look at the motion. Look at the upward thrust of this angle. It looks great, right? It looks great. It looks very uh, energetic as a design. And going on this patch, even the, the kind of slight weirdness to this patch where it has a little bit of like a slant, a slope, because I didn't design this patch. This art was brought to me by a customer. Um, this little slope, this little roundness to the patch, it's just kind of a quirky patch design. It looks really cool, right? Now, this was rendered with a basic, uh, you know, basic satin stitch patch. So it's an applique, basic satin stitch patch, nothing more. However, when the art came to me, all of these wings, all of this body of, of the flying monkey was flat. It was done in two colors and you're looking at them like a darker brown and a lighter brown. That's it. No definition to it whatsoever. For me, that is not what I'm looking for. I wanted something more and honestly, customer was overjoyed with it. But here are the ways I thought about it. Number one, I'm just going to be honest and say when I look at a wing, I'm looking at structures. Now, I did not carve every, every little piece of this into different feathers. The first thing I'm going to tell you I will often use as a shortcut even when I'm carving is that the little, the smaller feathers, the smaller runs of feathers on the upper edge of a wing are often pretty small and can be rendered with a fill stitch that has some texture in it. If I'm going to cut something out for time or if I'm going to cut something out because I don't want to do tons of little individual satins or I think that they're going to get kind of uh, jammed together too much, this is the area I will leave as a rough textured, random textured fill, as you can see here. Because if you look at it, really, I'm talking about... Um, I'm talking about the structure of a wing here. When I see a wing like this, I can see, even though the original art was flat, it had little bumps here that tells me I have flight feathers. You know, I've got these big feathers on there. I've got these, these long feathers out to the opposite edge. And I know, because I know what wings are made like, that you've got this kind of front leading edge on the wing that tends to be defined. And what I'm going to tell you is, Google is your friend, folks. If you're curious about how a wing is put together, if you want to see something, I mean, yeah, here, we're, yes, I'm showing you this stuff, but here's the deal. Both on the horse and on this, look at anatomy. Anatomy will show you, why do I make horse haunches separate from the body and the belly? Well, look at how the mus muscle structure is. If you look at the muscle structure of the horse, it doesn't have to be that you do an anatomical study, but look, look at how the shadow falls. We can split things here. We have a little split here. There's a curve that is natural to the belly. There's a curve that's natural to the neck. And we can see that the shoulder of the horse makes this curve. The legs have these cylindrical shapes to them that go really well as satin stitch. If we use any sort of splitting in the fill, we should split here. Why? Because that's where the shoulder muscle is. That's where the joint is. This is where we do think like artists where we stop and go, well, this leg is behind in the, this stature. I'm going to run this leg first so that I can have it be overlapped by the second leg. And I'm going to split the haunch right here and have two different pieces of fill stitch. This one will be underneath because it's further back. We'll do this one. We'll find a way to travel over to this haunch. Maybe we'll do the neck and we'll do the belly at the same time. So this haunch is on, on the front, but sometimes we can't do that. But we still are going to try and change our stitch angles and break them where the natural pieces of the horse are, where the anatomy makes sense. I went ahead and just searched for an eagle wing here. I don't have to go too far to tell you. If I look at this, you can see we have all these rows of little short stitches here. If I was doing a much larger wing rendering, I probably would try and do another row of satins. But if we look at this and we kind of squint, we say, all right, well, these flight feathers at the edge, these are long feathers that we want to really notate and show. Those are going to be our satin stitches. Why? They're long and cylindrical kind of shapes. They're narrow shapes we want to fill. This area up here can be rendered as a rough fill because it kind of melds together a little bit. It's more of a unit. However, we see that there's a leading edge here on a real wing. And often in the way that they're done in artistic fashion, you will see that, that a lot of wings are rendered with this solid kind of bar here that's supposed to show you that leading edge and the curve that's at the front edge of a wing, right? And you will see it in the feather patterns and the color patterns pretty frequently. So what are we going to do? Well, uh, if we have a really large wing, maybe we'll render it like this. This is a more artistic rendering, a vintage style art rendering. But we'll render the flight feathers for sure. We'll probably rather render the ones that are on this leading edge up here, even as they get shorter up to the top, because they stick out separately. They have these gaps here. And then we have this area that we might decide to do as a fill if we want to. Even in artistic renderings of wings, this little area could be filled if we want to. But we want to make sure and grab these wings. And we'll see. Look at all these illustrations. 
we have flight feathers sticking out. We have individual feathers here that we can use overlapped satin stitches for. And then this area has little bitty feathers that could be rendered as a fill and one big spine that kind of holds the front leading edge of the wing together. That's how wings are structured. You look at a few of them and yeah, some of the artistic renderings are not equal. The real wing does have more going on, but we can see how it breaks down to these sections. And once we know that it breaks down to these sections, even the artistic renderings of the wing make more sense. And once we look at the art itself, we're gonna go back to our art and say, we're looking at the art itself, even though I only had a shadow of this when I first did it, right? And I, unfortunately the original art is not on this piece. I thought I had it here and it's not. Uh, I do apologize for that. But the original art was entirely flat. Well, what I can see are the things that are already obvious to me. I know that I have these little bumps. That means I have wings there. I have the flight feathers and I can kind of follow that line and decide where they are. I see that I have a little edge here. I have a little corner here. These things were already present in the art. I could see that those were there. So, you know, I've got this little corner here. I've got these flight feathers here. I have this little point here. I've got this little point here. Those were showing on the art. I can see that this is the back of the spine here. I, I know that the second, this bottom, this wing here, this little wing that's sticking up is the wings in the back. So I want to render it first. And I know from these little bumps here that I've got individual feathers. Then I can take a little bit of artistic license. I don't have to be entirely slavish to the art. I can decide how I want this to run. Well, I know that about half to two thirds of the way up is where that little area of small feathers usually is on a wing. So I'm gonna break that wing up. So I'm gonna go ahead and break that up in here and I'm gonna have that fill. I'm gonna decide on a line. I'm gonna draw that line probably in like, what I usually do is use a line of stitching that I'm eventually gonna take out later. I'll use my stretch stitch tool and draw some lines separating this stuff out, probably in like a pink or some color that, I'm not, that isn't in the art so I can see what I'm doing. And then I'll just start breaking it up and say, all right, well, bottom wing has to go first. Um, in this particular case, I'm going to do the flight feathers first because I'm going to cover the top edge with this fill. So all the flight feathers here go first, then this piece, then I'm going to draw these edge feathers in, and then the back spine of that wing. Then I'm going to go into this wing, draw these bottom feathers first, then our flight feathers. These are on top of the top ends of these, and the fill is actually going to go before these flight feathers here, and then it's going to be that back spine again. And I know that because I understand how I want these things to layer in space. And after that, you'll see that I'm going to draw in the body because the wing is behind further away from us uh, than the body here. So I'm going to be looking at this area where I'm going to draw in these feathers, then the fill, then the flight feathers, these little guys who are on top, and then the spine of the wing. And you can see that that's how it travels. Uh, same thing here. We're going to break things up again. We have the legs, which are two split satins. Um, we have our tail, which doesn't matter quite as much because it's going to be behind kind of everything. Uh, and we'll see that I'm splitting the body apart so that I have, I have the flap of the jacket here is separate from the body. And then I have kind of a curve, the head is separate and we have split little hairs as well. And then the face, if we look at the face, it's also made of satin stitches. We can look at how the curves on the curved fill follow the shapes. But in essence, when we're splitting up the wing, it's the same kind of object we're looking at. What's furthest away from us? Well, the furthest away thing from us is going to be this wing. What comes further? What are we hiding? We're using these fills up here to hide these wings that are further down. These wings are overlapped by the wings inside or the feathers inside. Uh, and then these wing tips are going to kind of run on top. And part of its artistic merit, I mean, I could definitely have made another split here that would have been more detailed, but I, I elected not to. And then I've got a couple little winglet little feathers here at the edge that are leading and then that spine. So let's go ahead and actually run through it. Uh, of course, we've got the border, which actually ran last in the real patch, but Suffice it to say, this is what we had for this artistic piece. I'm gonna go ahead and show you all these runs. So here, here's the feathers on the bottom wing, the back wing that's for this from us. Then we have the fill that gets the top of that. We have the little tiny feathers that make the junction and then the kind of that leading edge of the wing. Once again, flight feathers. Then we do this fill, covers the top of those little feathers. Then those ones that are on the outside edge. And then that spine. We run down and do the tail because it's going to be behind the rest of the body. I just went ahead and did that also because I'm going from the left kind of to the right in this case. Inside of the arm, uh, you still can't see it, but I don't think it's really as critical to go out there and look at it. Um, you know, why not? We'll go ahead and go to the entire design one more time. Well, let's run through it. So I said to say, once we get in there, we're going to get down into the leg. So you got to see the, the wing up close. Split that up. There's those little feathers on top. Flight feathers at the edge leading edge of the wing. And now we've got that lovely carved pair of wings. And I, there is nothing like the facets of those satin stitches shining as you turn this thing in real space. Um, it makes 
and, and by the way, great for all eagles on top of badges. Great for all sorts of, uh, there's tons of militaria. There's tons of logos, badges, metallic pieces that are done in, in you know metal threads or metallic colored threads, especially like police and fire and military that have winged things on them. Carving those wings makes them so much less boring. And tell you the truth, less stitch count than the fill. Less stitch count than a fill. So more time digitizing, less time in the machine. Just how it is. Run the little tail. Then you're going to see the arm, just the leading edge of the arm. It's going to be dark brown. I didn't do the entire one because we got a lot of the light brown to cover. We're going to go the back leg, then the leg that's closest to us, overlapped. And once again, that's that length limit edge padded satin type stitch here. And I didn't split the foot from it. In this case, they were in line and I think it looked fine. Then we have the flap of the jacket that's behind the body that's the furthest from us. We have kind of the bottom of the jacket and body, the inner portion of the body there because we're gonna run on top of that later. We have also the little hairs that are on the top of the head first because I want the forehead to be in front of them. It's like a forelock, the forehead, the head is actually closer to us than those are. And then we're using a uh, curved fill here that is set to a random stitch penetration so that we have some roughness in it. So it looks like fur. Instead of rendering this as real fur, this was a piece that, like I said, came in entirely flat. I went ahead and used the randomness of stitch penetrations in that head to make it look like fur. Random looks organic. Random stitch links will look more like fur or furry or rough than smooth stitch penetrations. Could be the same number of stitches. Having them offset makes them look rough. Rough looks organic, looks more like animals, looks more like a real organic object, natural object. Then we're gonna see that the um, the lip is rendered separately. We rendered the lip, the bottom lip and the top lip separately as satins. And then we have the eye kind of area. And then the brow ridge is a satin stitch and the cheek is a satin on top of that. And actually, I think that's worth zooming in on real quick to kind of show you. Once again, we're building the face out of elements. We didn't just make a flat face. The face is built out of several satin stitch elements so that it has detail and it has dimension. The chin is going to be the furthest down in this case, because if you think of how a chimpanzee or a monkey is, you tend to have that prognathic, that upper face, the mid face sticks out forward. So we have that prominent upper jaw. So we have the prominent upper jaw. We have the little eye and cheek line. Then we have the um, upper brow ridge, and then the cheek that's closest to us is coming away from that. So we've used curved satins for all those, and we get a lot of detail in there. We get a lot of shine and shadow. After that, we're gonna go ahead and do the brown outlining on that because we wanna have some real tight detail. And then we're gonna zoom back out so you can actually see everything again. Uh, and we'll go ahead and show you this last section of the brown where we have the collar, we have the edge of the jacket. So the jacket is not actually separate from the body. It follows the same curve as the body. We're just using that satin stitch edge to note that we have kind of an open flap on that jacket. Then we have the bottom one right there. We have uh, the sleeve and you're gonna notice that bell curve to the sleeve. The bell curve just gives you the, the, the sense that the sleeve is round in space. Curved fills are great for that. So if, you're if your software doesn't have curved fills, get software that does, uh, Stitch Artist, you're gonna have that. Uh, at the levels I'm using. We're gonna have the back of the elbow and I actually did separate that from the forearm to give it a little more definition. You'll also see the side of the hand and then the fingers are separate. The, the little finger, which by the way, I love this as a detail, um, the little finger that's curled up on this piece, you'll see actually runs separately so that the fingers look like the curled little finger is closest to us on the hand. And you'll see that instead of just having the finger sticking out, I actually have a little curled finger at that end. And then of course, just the outlining around the hand. Uh, so I do have a little bit of extra detail that I did here. This outlining is done separately. So I have revisited color in here a couple times. I did use the light brown twice. I used the dark brown twice because I wanted these outlines to really hit exactly where I wanted them in the face because the face is super important on any character. If it doesn't look clean, the entire design is a failure. And then on the out back end of the arm here, I wanted it to absolutely hit every time. So I allowed myself an extra color change. Probably could have made it more efficient, but I think that not traveling between them and allowing myself that extra outline uh, made this look very crisp and clean. Plus I didn't want to have the straight stitch outline or traveling anywhere else in the design. So yeah, that is, that is how I rendered that piece. 
Um, I will, I'm going to answer a couple questions. We do have a couple questions. If you have any other last questions, I know we're running way into bonus time. We're going to stop here very shortly. Um, I promised I would go through these things. So I said, you know what? I'm going to analyze all the designs I said I would this time because this is two episodes in a row. Uh, I know this means a really long show. Thank you for everybody who hung out, especially if it was interesting to you. Um, and tell your friends if they were in for the analysis to ch jump in later and watch me do the designs at the last minute. I really need to split these out sometimes. Here's the last couple questions though. Uh, real quick. Well, first thing, a couple comments. Lisa, re referring to my light use of color says, you get great color changes by your artistic stitch choices. Totally. Uh, that's that's something that I think you learn through restriction. When I tell people that restriction be a, can be creative, it seems like having every tool, everything under the sun and every color makes things be the best they can be. I would say restricting yourself to a smaller set means that there are less decisions you can make and it makes you find new ways to solve problems creativity and creatively. So I like to restrict my colors because it means I do use stitch types to do things. Uh, and I'll say this, uh, Ramona, how do you get the shoulder on the horse or a dog not to look like a lollipop? Um, by not having a really sharp edge, you can feather the edge of the second fill if you want to, or honestly, by just using curves around it and not breaking the entire shoulder up, I will often also just use a small carving line that just indicates the shoulder of the horse, or I'll just shade on top of it. If I think that I don't want it to be really, uh, really tight, I will go ahead and just run the curve up and then change the curve. Let the, like, I'll run the curve along the horse and then break, break the other side off of it. Um, it. Let me go ahead and pop this thing. And yes, I know I'm going for a record on time, folks. I do apologize for being so late. Hopefully it's some valuable stuff for you. But if I'm looking at it, I might just go ahead and use one fill here, fill in this curve and then break the curve differently here. So all I have to note that there's a difference in the shoulder, instead of using a whole piece that's on the, on the horse separately, that's layered, is just that the curve breaks there and then use a second color of shading right here lightly uh, to break it up. I have also, like I said, um, feathered the back edge of this so it's a little bit more like fur or honestly rendered the entire thing as one curve if I'm concerned about it only breaking just a little bit. Like I said, if the, if there's a curve fill, I'm curving here and then curving out away from it. Hopefully you can see that clearly enough. Oh my gosh, my cursor is on the wrong side. Okay, sorry guys. I'm curving here in the fill into the belly and then I'm curving over the top here in a single fill. And what I would say is I'm more concerned often, I think that the back leg haunch has a tendency to look a little bit more dimensional and want to be broken up more than the front shoulder sometimes. And so instead of getting the lollipop action though, you can elect, and I often do, to break it about here where I'm going with the split satin up to this point. And then I have another fill that breaks up to here. And then the body is actually a fill that follows and curves across. And as it curves, we end up with a little shading here. We end up with a change in the stitch angle, but we might not separate that into separate pieces. On very small horses, I will do it all in satin stitches because you don't see so much of that uh, lollipop look. But I'm with you. You can't end up with some weirdness if you really break it all up into individual pieces on everything. Um, and you'll see, like I did with the uh, like I did with the monkey, as we just showed, um, I elected not to break everything up. The, the body and the shirt, I, I didn't break into two different pieces. I left it one piece and just left some shading to note what was the different pieces. The important part of that curve was just to say the body is rounded, so I used a curved fill that follows that round body. Um, same thing with the wings. Like I said earlier, you can totally um, elect to split every little piece of a wing up and have all these little feathers. Often on a smaller piece, it doesn't make sense. So I will use a fill for a big chunk of it and then just only separate the most critical feathers or even just the feathers on the tip of the wing sometimes. All right, folks. So I think that we are <laughs> we are in it. We are done. I'm going to go ahead and bring myself up full on for the screen. We'll answer the last few comments and then I'm going to show you one thing that I am doing soon because I, I feel like I should promote it. And after that, we are gone. Uh, Brian says, word of the day, prognathic. Yeah, sorry, guys. Um, uh, my wife, evolutionary anthropologist. Uh, one of the things you learn about early hominids is if you have uh, a mid face, a, a upper jaw that comes forward, that's called prognathic. So enjoy my big word of the day, folks. That's what I do. Uh, Clarinda says, thank you. Thank you for being here, especially if you hung out for the whole thing. You guys are the real, the real reciprocators. Uh, hour and hour and three quarters. Yeah, maybe 1.75 hours. This is the, this is the, this is the longest one. Brian, you are correct. Thank you for the time, Brian. Everybody thank Brian Bailey very much for the fact that I have other work I need to be doing and I'm doing this. <laughs> so thank, thank Brian and, and in brilliance for making it possible for me to do these things. Uh, Gina says, really appreciate you allowing you to see the simulated stitch out. Yeah, absolutely. We are going to do more of this. I have been asked over and over to do this stuff. I am going to be doing more of these analyses. I think that it's worthwhile, maybe not as long as this, 
but we will be adding more simulated stitch out stuff like that. <laughs> Mike wants the long show. Daryl's happy for the long show. DJ, thank you much, especially coming from you because you teach this stuff as well. So thank you for that. Frank, always love having you in. And the fact that you're up late, Frank, who never sleeps. Daniel, by the way, go look up Daniel's work. I, I, as much as it's not maybe the most, not everybody loves the outdoor stuff. Some of your fish stuff, Daniel, go look at that stuff. Lovely work. He does this great outdoors work that is just worth looking at. And uh, the, the, like I said, go back to the impressions contest and look at Daniel's work. Um, really incredible naturalistic work that should be lauded. And hence why, when I was judging it, I did so. Um, uh, but Aaron, Hey, thank you, Aaron. <laughs> you might want to go back for the replay if you're just joining in. And Daniel says, I could talk shop with you for eight hours. Likewise, sir. And honestly, I could talk shop with each and every one of you folks for hours, because honestly, you are the guys who give back. You are the, the, the guys, gals, the, uh, everybody <laughs> of every orientation. You guys are here. You are doing your thing. You are learning. You want to be doing what you want to do. You are actually engaging and investing in your education. You are the ones who are on top right now. You for listening, for being here, for trying, for caring, you are the top of the class. You are, you're the top 5% for trying it all. You're the top 1% for sticking it out and actually making things happen. So if you take this out and practice any of it, top 1% and you will be the top 1% in how you do. And so, yeah. <laughs> and Mike says, Hey, Brian's listening to the value of these is hard to put a price tag. Yeah, I know. And what I'll say is this. Um, I'm very happy that the people in the Embrilliance community, the Stitch Arts community have accepted me into their ranks, despite the fact that I am a inveterate commercial guy and doing all kinds of commercial eclectic work, or not eclectic, but efficient work that may not be as artistic and fun. And it has been great to have uh, the Embrilliance people, the community who have come to accept my weirdness and, uh, me saying prognathic in the middle of the show. But the last thing I'm going to leave you guys with is just one little promo thing. I don't usually do this, but this has been a hard time for the shows. And I've been, I've been told that really uh, they would be appreciative very much. If you guys are into embroidery business or a uh, decorative apparel business, a um, couple of things I'll promote. Number number one, of course, you guys have heard it in brilliance. You want to see what I was working in? I was in Stitch Artist. That was the t software I was working on. Um, very cool things coming for Stitch Artist, and I'd love you to look at it. Other thing I'm going to promote, um, and by the way, if you don't know, also do a lot of the, the web stuff and fun stuff for Embrilliance. So go to embrilliance.com and check it out. There's a lot of fun stuff here, and you can see all the features. And the fun thing is you will occasionally get Easter eggs if you're somebody who's uh, been around me for a long time. You may occasionally see some design work that probably uh, Eric did. I always love when there's Easter eggs in things like video games. So you'll see that, um, yep, that's a font that I showed you guys that I did once. Uh, so go check out Stitch Artist. That's the first thing I'll, I'll kind of say, hey, because Brian's here, I want you to especially know he has been absolutely supportive and helped me to continue giving you guys this. And he's the one who named the take up. So thank Brian Bailey for that. The other thing I do want to do is stop and just say, hey, guys, you're in the business stuff. Go check out Dax. Dax show is still putting on online seminars despite the fact that we haven't been able to meet in person. So if you want to see what's there, plus if you're if you're one of my fans, you may well listen to the two regular guys this morning, Aaron Montgomery, Terry Combs, uh, and people like who are on our show that's in the morning, Dave Harding, who's doing like equipment financing. We've got some new folks like Kelly. I don't believe I've heard stu her stuff, but heat transfers. Vic, Vic Autry is great uh, talking about like e-commerce stuff and Shopify. Bruce Ackerman, who created Printavo is pretty cool. Like there's a lot of really interesting people talking art and embroidery and digitizing. This is all online stuff and they're cheap classes, guys. It's like 35 bucks uh, for the early bird and regular prices right now. The prices are like 35 bucks to see one of these. Um, the ones that I'm doing, I'm going to be honest with you guys, they are not the uh, digitizing ones this year. They asked me to weigh in on the other thing that I often do, which is e-commerce and business. So you will see that my sessions this year might not be for you. It's like everyday e-commerce for embroiderers. It's some e-commerce uh, related stuff. That's what I'm talking about this time around. Um, and also you'll see that we, well, we have, we have Aaron who is there about niche marketing. We've got uh, clay Barbera Corel trainer talking about Corel draw. So like I said, I'm not, I, I'm not shilling. I'm not, I'm not saying you have to go do it. What I will say is these are uh, really dedicated people who do awesome stuff. And uh, I would love for you to look at the stuff at Dax show. So on that links list that I shared with you guys, the last link there is, or one of the last links is the Dax seminar track. Um, if you're in business, please check it out. 
Scott Ritter over at DAX and their family have been really supportive of me and of the industry for many years. And I think they're worth checking out. Um, everybody goes and does the big shows like ISS Long Beach, stuff like that. And I love, I love ISS or Impressions Expo. And I did their online stuff this year as well. Um, they're great shows. Uh, not everybody can get out to the coasts, and everybody in the Midwest has really benefited from the dedication of the DAX shows people. And like I said, I would love for you guys to go check out uh, Stitch Artists and all the tools that uh, we make at Imbrilliance. I mean, like I said, I am the first person to be software agnostic and show you all the different kinds of tools because you can make masterpieces anywhere you are. But uh, I know the kind of love, care, and quality and, and the work that gets put into this tool. And I'm seeing all the cool stuff we're making. And I would love for you to see what we're doing there too, because it's a big part of my life and a big part of what I do. So those things I promote. I don't promote things very often. The other thing I will say I would love for you to do, I we are now over a thousand strong in subscribers, which for big giant YouTube channels isn't a lot, but for us, what it does mean is um, that I can do things like community post. I posted a poll on YouTube the other day. Uh, if you have friends who you think would like the show, share the show, send them to ericcampbell.com where you can find the take up link. Uh, subscribe, turn on the notifications. If you're on Facebook right now, uh, follow me and you'll be able to get the notifications from my page because uh, it goes out on my page as well as my personal profile. If you want to be reminded, follow my page, the Eric Campbell page, and you will get those reminders. And also, it, it I do certainly repost in a lot of embroidery groups. Frank has been awesome about reposting in his group as well. But what I will say is uh, if you follow me there or if you put on the notifications on YouTube, you'll always know when I'm live. So turn on the subscription, click the bell for notifications. It will always let you know when I'm on. With that, guys, longest show ever. You could have gone to the movies, but you stayed here with me. And for that, I, I love y'all. <laughs> Thank you for being here. And I can't wait to see you guys again next Friday.